Welcome to Who's Views, and yes, welcome to our Easter April Fool's Day special. There you go. How's that, everyone? Very Pretty good. Damn fine. <laughs> <laughs> As you can see, I'm joined by George, by Paul, Hello. by Phil, and by Third Doctor Ian, and we're here to celebrate those legendary comics that found their way into Doctor Who. How? I'm not quite sure. John Inter, mostly, but <laughs> we are going to be coming to them very, very soon. So it's good to see you. And yeah, it is Easter. Can you tell by my, my lovely ears? Can you? Can you? Very fit. Yes. I like it. Yep. Yep. And I'm shaking my eggs at you. I'm sure you are. It's got things in them. I'm so excited I about that. Me. It's lovely. Um, yes, but I don't, yeah, here we are on our Easter special, our April Fool's Day special. But I don't know if you saw today as well. Did you see the breaking news? Real breaking news. Going to do a bit, a bit of a headlines moment now, but there was some breaking news. Let's have a look and see what it was. Yes, news today was absolutely, there were two bits of news today that you may not have seen, and it's really, really important. The first bit of news is new Shooty Gatwa has exited Doctor Who and Matt Smith is replacing him to return as the 16th Doctor and the Daleks will no longer exterminate but educate in big Doctor Who change. Now this news of course today has shaken Doctor Who fandom to its very, very core. I have to say thank you to Doctor Who TV for breaking this news earlier today. What are your guys' reactions to this piece of news? Well, knowing, knowing the current predicament around, it's bound to be true. So uh, what can I say? <laughs> <laughs> it was, of course, fabulous. <laughs> but do you know what? People fell for it. And it was, was actually like, because... for a minute. That one there, he was thinking about that, didn't he? Yeah. He was thinking about yes, that Matt one. Yes, Matt Smith, yes. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> uh, Doctor Who TV played a blinder today with those two lead stories. Look at them again. If, uh, bring them up again. Yeah, look at that. Shooty Gatwa exits Doctor Who. Matt Smith returns as the 16th Doctor. And then, which they post, the Daleks will no longer exterminate, but educate and big Doctor Who change. Because it is it, was, it, was, it is the 1st of April. And that, it was just brilliant. And the write-up for it, if I can just give you a, a, the write-up for this. Listen to this. In the Matt Smith story, the BBC Today confirms that Shooty Gatwa will depart Doctor Who after his second season as the 15th Doctor set to wear in 2025. Matt Smith renowned for his role as the 11th Doctor, will once again step into the TARDIS, this time as the 16th incarnation of the Time Lord, mir mirroring David Tennant's celebrated Doctor Who return last year. Shooty Gatwa, who has already won hearts worldwide with his betrayal, expressed his feelings about leaving the role and passing the baton back to Smith. To journey through time and space as the Doctor has been a privilege and a whirlwind of emotions. I've loved every minute and every challenge and every adventure, but the theatre calls to me. The Thata calls to me. This is so weird. This is what I reckon we're going to get one day. Um, <laughs> I can't think of anyone better than Matt to take the series to new heights, and I'm excited to see him bring his unique energy back to the TARDIS. Isn't it? It's just bizarre, isn't it? It's absolutely... But you, fandom, it, calm down. Yeah. It was April the 1st. Yeah. <laughs> to be fair, though, even though it's April the 1st, like I said, it's it's highly, highly credible, isn't it? Let's be honest. <laughs> Well, that, that particular one is, but it's the Dalek one that really gets us, isn't it, really? The, hello to everybody in the chat. Uh, Lex Kane is saying, April Fool's news, I think. <laughs> Gore Vidal is with us. Is this an April Fool's joke? Sadly, yes. 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 Yeah. Sadly, yes. Sadly, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Tardis Travels is saying, to, <laughs> nah, it's April Fool's news. Kirsty is in the chat saying, my boys. Yeah, she's in the chat because she's uh, saving up ready for chocolate. That's what she's doing. Gemma, hello. Happy Easter. Happy Easter to you, Gemma. Nice to see you. And um, we've got, oh, garbage is also there. JT, hope you remember the hot crust buns. Well, I did buy it. <laughs> We're very nice. We're very tasty garbage. So thank you to Car uh, Garbage and Coast for being in the chat and making sure everybody is happy there. And Julie is here. Hi, Julia. Hello, JT. Love the suit. Thank you very much. 
<laughs> yeah, it I'm does not... look like a full bunny suit, doesn't it? Does everyone think that? I think it does. Yeah, <laughs> they're not staying on though. <laughs> Matt, don't worry about this, Matt. The silent wee music here. What's that silly thing on your head? It's my bunny ears. What do you mean silly? There's a story to this. I got this in from a nightclub when I was a bully girl. But that's that's a different story completely. Um, so it yes. looks like here, doesn't it? <laughs> I hear probably, yes. <laughs> and I can say that without any fear of repercussions, hopefully. But... Exactly. Well, you, well, know, you never yeah. know. Yeah. yeah, I never know, yeah. Yeah, you never know in this crazy world, but yeah. But I just want to say congratulations to them uh, for Doctor Who TV for these two April Fool's gags and for sending some fans into a whirl of a frenzy. It was quite bizarre. I think I think a lot of people, guys, just woke up and forgot what day it was this morning. Yeah. Or it yeah. was wishful thinking. Yeah. Like, what oh, was was wishful thinking? The, the, the Daleks would make very strict believe. teachers, though. That'd be quite good. I'd be a Dalek <laughs> with a teacher. That'd be superb. Yeah, well, it would just like, it would just like, you know, zap you, wouldn't they? Yeah, yeah. well, they're not allowed to exterminate, only educate, it said there, but maybe as a last resort. You know, no detention, just extermination instead. That'd be quite good. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. Uh, Dalek, I love you, is here. Hello, nice to see you. And Kirsty is saying that he's a Playboy bunny. Yes, and was for quite a while. Yeah, but there you go. Uh, right, yeah, brilliant. Um, so there you go. That was that. Well done to them. I thought that was just a bit of fun just to start this particular show off. Yeah, playing for laughs. And I think now, I think, I think now, I think we're going to go to something a little bit funny. Now, if, if you can see Phil down there, Behind him, he's got lots of gorgeous, loving looking 1980s pastel colors behind him, and each one has a number on it. Behind one of those numbers is a joke for this very special Easter April Fool's Day show. And um, yeah, whenever we want a joke, we speak to our own fool down there and we say to him, What number? Uh, and we'll give him a number, and then he's going to tell us. So we're going to start that off now with a number five, please, Phil. Number five. And I don't want to excite people, but some of these jokes have been AI generated. Oh. Ooh, oh. it's, it's all posh on this show, isn't it? In fact, number five has been AI generated. Oh, there you go. We're starting as we right, need to go on then, gentlemen. everyone. Why did the Cyberman fail his driving test? Oh, I don't know. Why did the Cyberman fail his driving test? Because he couldn't parallel process. <laughs> So well, that's me AI removing gag. my shears from AI. Comedians worldwide breathe a sigh of relief that they've got this one. Uh, there we go. Yeah. What was that strike all about? <laughs> <laughs> yep. Okay. So we're uphill from there, though, JT. I assure you. I'm. I'm. Well, we're British. We get on with that sort of stuff, don't we? So there we go. So yeah, what we're think, doing. Um, I don't think Ken Dobbs' legacy is under threat at this moment, is it? Really. <laughs> do, you have any, do you have any Christmas cracker jokes in there as well? Of interest? It's <laughs> level too high brow. I yeah. don't want to go that high. <laughs> We are going to be talking about Doddy later on in the show because, of course, what this particular show is about, we are going to be celebrating some of those comics that found their way into Doctor Who over its 60-year uh, history. Just some of them, because when you look at the history of Doctor Who, there was actually an awful lot that managed to get into the show one way over the other. And there's no way we could do justice for them in this little show. So we're going to do some of them. And actually, I was thinking, how do we start the show off after Phil's joke? And I'm going to do it again. Somebody give me a number between 1 and 15. 13. 13. And that's how we're going to start the show. And actually, this is all about, oh, it's about this particular lovely lady. This is Joan Sims, everybody. Joan Sims. Yes. Yay. Comic character actress as well, wasn't she? Was She was really, she was a brilliant character actress, wasn't she? She did so much when we were all kids. Um, and of course, known mainly for the Carry On films. But in the Carry On films, of course, she shows just how versatile she is. Because, you know, on the left there, she was playing that very suave sort of... Uh, <laughs> I say suave. She was common as muck, really. But she really wanted to be... <laughs> wanted to be a Madame lady. Madame yeah. Desiree. Madame Desiree. And all she wanted to do was marry a title. Yeah. <laughs> she's got, she's got the false teeth in the... Uh... Yes. That's the one. Yes, of course, but yes, I think in that one, I think she got away with the rudest carry-on joke ever. And it took me years to catch on to it. Which one? Where, where she's talking with Charles Hawtrey, where he's trying to seduce her. In the arbor. And, uh, yes, in the arbor. And um, in the film she played, uh, she and Kenneth Williams are uh, brother and sister. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And uh, Joan Sims says to... Um, uh, 
to Charles Hawtrey, my brother, the kind. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> and for years, I didn't get onto that. And then all of a sudden, I just got to like, Joan! <laughs> <laughs> she delivers it beautifully, though, and it shows her talent, doesn't it? And on the right there, we're looking at one of those other famous roles that she played in the carry-ons, which was the what we used to call the battle axe. Mm -hmm. A very determined, hard woman. No, you well, didn't mess around with them. As Sid James would find out an awful lot in these. But yeah, she was a fabulous yeah. character actress, George, yeah. wasn't she? In that second photo, that's her as Cora Flange in Carry On Abroad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Says it all, doesn't it, really? <laughs> and of course, she made her way into Doctor Who in 1986. But for such a, a fabulous actress as well, um, and it's, it's weird that when you look at some of the, a lot of these comics, they all have some terrible times connecting them all in their lives. You know, for people that are always laughing and joking and ha 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 ha, a lot of them went through an awful lot of trauma. Um, but Joan Sims, she was around for such a long time. And it took until 1986 for her to appear in Doctor Who. And for such a fantastic actress and a comic time, and she ended up playing Queen Katrika. Remember, in The Trial of a Time Lord. So what do we think about that? Well, I, I, I quite was... enjoyed her performance when I saw it originally. And I think it's not, not a bad performance at all. Um, she's playing it really straight, which, which is interesting in this season, you know. But uh, I think she's really strong, don't you? Hmm? I think I she's mean, strong, yeah. But... I would well, have known her from comedy, so I would have seen her in Carry On films. And wasn't she in that? Is it on the up with uh, Le um, Dennis, Waterman. Dennis Waterman? Yeah. So, so to see her then sort of go from being this this comedy foil to being an actual actress, I was a bit yeah jarring. But I but I love the performance. You know, I love Trial of the Time Lord Ob, and um, yeah, I think she's really good in it. Okay, George, what do you think? Well, I watched it for the first time ever very recently. And I have to say, I wasn't impressed. I thought it was a huge wasted opportunity. You had somebody of Joan's calibre and talent, and it just seemed to be a throwaway part. Mm. Yeah, I, I'm inclined to agree with that. I was very excited when I heard that Joan Sims was going into, into Doctor Who back in 86. And even when we saw her publicity with the two guns and that outfit, I was still sort of like, oh, well, OK, she's going to be very sort of gung-ho and piratey and all this. And then we got this sort of old woman, really, um, you know, sitting in the chair for most. I was, I was a bit disappointed. I thought, no, she could have done a lot more. Was she not described as uh, Bonnie Langford's granny or something? Yes. Yeah. yeah, simply because of the wig. Yes. You know, look at that. That was a wig, everybody, for Trial of a Time Lord. And certainly red hair seemed to be a thing <laughs> back then as well, really. <laughs> Ian, what did you make of that? Do you remember, do you remember Joni going into that? Oh, yeah. I mean, it was the uh, first episode that she was in was shown at, uh, I think it was Panopticon 7. Because um, obviously it, it started with the fantastic visual effects shot, didn't it, uh, of the Time Lord space station. Um, so I remember her first episode vividly um, for that. But the part itself is quite forgettable. And I remember two things more ab about it. First off was brilliant um tony selby as as uh glitz yep. saying to Dibba, in reference to her i have a way with aging females Dibba, <laughs> which which <laughs> always makes me laugh and um and then the second one was when um the uh which was the big robot was it the l1 or the l3 the l3 had uh, yeah. a, and Draft. killed her and her right hand yeah. man and yeah you saw him grab and then you saw all these veins on their face i thought oh that's quite striking and then of course she was dead but the actual part that she played after that was was not memorable really no yeah that's that's, that's what got me about that because I, I i really like joan sims i can watch anything with joan sims in and has including the film that lex kane is telling us about here that joan was in the disney movie one of our dinosaurs is missing and it's a fantastic movie it is and i got that yeah. on tv before they actually pull it because when they suddenly realized that Peter Ustinov is playing Chinese. Mm -hmm. 
um, they might pull it because <laughs> uh, it was back in the 70s. I think it's already been pulled. I think it's already been pulled. I think uh, uh, they can't, can't show on TV anymore, unfortunately, not on the BBC anyway. But uh, well, no, well, they, oh, that, and Bernard Bristol are both in that as well. They are. Yeah. Percy yeah. plays yeah. the old guy as he as he usually does, the eccentric guy with the shotgun as a tally helps, <laughs> you know, shooting a dinosaur that's already yeah. dead. Fabulous performance. Yeah. <laughs> and Bernard Preslow plays Chinese as well. Yeah. Um, I think the big missed opportunity with Joan Sims and Doctor Who, though, was if you remember back in the 70s, uh, Tom Baker was frequently interviewed and he said he'd love yeah. a different type of companion, a middle-aged woman who was always out of breath, bad-tempered, and yeah. know, the, the number one name he would always put to it was Joan Sims. Yeah. And I think, I personally think that would have been a wonderful combination between Baker and Sims. Mm -hmm. They would have been fabulous and, and, and hit off together, you know, but we never got to see that. And it's such a shame, really, isn't it? But God loved Joan Sims, I think, because she was, uh, again, she was part of our childhood. You know, you saw her on all sorts of things, really, including the wonderful one of our dinosaurs is missing. Um, I'm going to just uh, garbage has put this in the chat. As this is a stream about laughs, are we going to talk about that dull, bland, uninteresting trailer? No, quite frankly, we're not. We're not going to talk about that today. If you want to talk about that, you've got to come back tomorrow for headlines where we will talk about that. But this one's about proper doctor. Oh, I'm sorry. This is about um, Doctor Who and 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 joy and happiness and wonderful things like that uh in fact mark's saying it properly here proper doctor who always found the best guest stars <laughs> oh you're on naughty mark tardis travels is also reminding us that the first carry-on actor was hartnell as he starred in carry-on sergeant that's right yeah. he helped to launch yeah, the he series was, he was the original carry-on star um and he yeah. was offered a part in carry-on nurse the second carry-on film uh, but he wanted too much money and the part went to Wilfred Hyde White. Right. Yeah. The um the all famous fade out gag of um, Hattie Jakes with the um with the daffodil at the end. Yes, that's right. Yes, that, that could have been hard. That's a strange way to take a temperature, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, the original that originally was going to be William Hartnell, not yeah. William, not uh, oh, Wilfred Hyde White. Yeah. That's, that's brilliant to know that one, isn't it? You know, that, yeah, but that was the problem with a lot of these people, wasn't it? And um, we want this sort of money, and of course. The carry on not turning around saying well, bye <laughs> that's not gonna happen oh bless time lord 2023 is here saying such a great actress i enjoyed the trial of a time lord episodes good fantastic um yeah so we've got all that so that was joan sims um this we're going to be coming to john pertwee himself in cleo screaming and cowboy we will be coming to that remind me tardis travels yes. and can, I, can I mention a little a little boring fact here about carry on sergeant i watched it recently and in the ranks of the soldiers is derek martinez as an act as an actor as an extra in mm. that film who directed obviously 10th planet uh, mission to unknown etc so uh look out for him when you're watching it again uh, also in there is Bernard Kay, who appeared in well, several, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, several uh, Doctor Who's over the years. It's it's just brilliant. I love all that period of time in British uh, <laughs> entertainment because they all knew each other, it seemed, and they all, you know, they knew the right people and they were all getting all the... I just love it all because they crop up over and over and over again. And as soon as we started with Joan Sims, let's stay with an, another um, carry-on star. Can there I, is no other word to talk about. Can I just Joan Sims again, briefly? Yeah. Only because, quite by coincidence, on YouTube this morning, yeah, um, it suggested a um, TVM interview with John Pertwee, where he yeah. was in um, Wurzel Gummidge. And he played this clip of him with Joan Sims in Wurzel mm -hmm. Gummidge, where basically he's awful to her. And he's saying yeah. like that all these other girls wouldn't make good scarecrows, but she would, because you have to be old and ugly to be a scarecrow. <laughs> yeah. He takes it so well. I mean, yeah. it's just brilliant. It's a really lovely clip. Because Joan was in that in Wales of Gummidge as well. Mm -hmm. You know, she played the Lady of the Manor, didn't she? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 Fantastic. Very, very it, there's a great. There's a great episode, I think, when uh, uh, Wazzle and Aunt Sally are staff at a house and they just wreck the place. It's brilliant. It's <laughs> really funny. But yeah. Yeah. Uh, Alex is saying he, he saw that on YouTube on Saturday night. Um... That's great. Wurzel Gummidge is currently rerunning on Talking Pictures TV, isn't it? It yeah. is, yep. And also, the complete box set is available now on DVD and Blu-ray. So check your stockets for that. Recommend it. Superb, superb yep. series. Yep. We're going we're gonna to stay with um, the carry-on. i uh, say they are stars. We're going to use the word stars because they were absolutely uh, huge celebrities, these people. And we're going to talk to, well, we're going to look at 
Jones, or one of Jones' co-stars that managed to get across to Doctor Who. And this is the late, great Peter Butterworth. Uh-huh. Also known, of course, as the meddling monk. Um, and this was just another, I mean, another scoop at the time was getting Peter Butterworth into the show because he was known, wasn't he? He was, he was, he was, he was a star. He was very well known at the time. He wasn't a Carry On star at that point. He did The Time Meddler yeah. directly before Carry On Cowboy, which was his first Carry On. Mm. Uh, he literally okay. finished He literally finished The Time Meddler, then went to Pinewood and did Carry On Cowboy. Wow. So, but by the time he came back for the Daleks Master Plan, he'd done three Carry Ons and was working on a fourth. Yeah. Uh, but he'd, he'd done an awful lot of stuff for things like the Children's Film Foundation before then, so he would have been very well known to the audience at the time. His comic ability, though, is just fantastic. And when you do look at the time meddler, obviously he's he's playing that really straight, that particular role, but there is that wicked glance he's got there, isn't it? He's got that tongue-in-cheek humour in there, and he does manage to put that in in the time meddler. I, I think he's one of those comic actors that literally had funny bones. Yeah, <laughs> he, he could just make anything funny. Yeah, yeah. And you can you can also see in that in that story particularly that Hartnell is bouncing off Butterworth beautifully, and they're mm-hmm. really having a lot of fun together, which is great to watch. I like this picture I found here as well of Hartnell and Butterworth from a previous movie they'd done. They'd worked mm-hmm. together a couple of times before, um, and I just I, again it just highlights that thing I was saying about you know how these actors all walked in the same circles really. You know, and they, is, they that, is this double, double confessions? This film, is this it? is double confessions, apparently. Yes, if I'm wrong about that, let me know. But I'm I, I got this from um, that film from the Associated British. So, and Peter, yeah. Peter Laurie's in this film, which is bizarre seeing Hartnell and Peter Laurie in the same mm-hmm. film. It's amazing, absolutely. Casting. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but again, it was just even as the monk, and just to let you know as well, we are going to be talking about the time meddler in one of our reviews in a couple of weeks' time. So, come and join us for that. Um, but it was again. It's just that beautiful ability of of actually being an all round character actor, as, uh, just as Joan Sims were. These people had real talent. They were able to look at things and and alter their performance to whatever they were in. That's what used to get me annoyed in fandom when G A T would cast an actor that was known for comedy, but they'd all done lots of street acting. They're actors. Give them a chance to act, for goodness' sake. Mm. You know what I mean? It happens still today, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, when you look when you look at people being cast into all sorts of things, people look at their work rather than the the possibility. I mean, look what happened to Billy. Yeah, mm-hmm. Billy Piper when she was cast. Um, have any of you got a favourite moment? I mean, this is from one of my favourite Carry On films. Now, have any of you got a favourite moment of uh, Mr. Butterworth's here from anything, whether it be Doctor Who or one of his other films? I like where is in the Carry On film? Uh, is it up the Kyber where they're uh, shelling the building while they're having lunch? <laughs> Well, and he's having a fit. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's, everybody else is just cool as yeah. a cucumber, and and he's just absolutely losing it. That is just how how they did that with a straight face. I do not know. I don't think they did. I think it was a couple of takes from what I remember reading. Uh, no, uh, I love that. I love it. <laughs> it's a great uh, scene though. If you haven't seen that film, go and see it. There's another well, if they haven't clipped it down to two minutes yet. <laughs> I don't know about this. Let's have a look. Julia in the chat. It's nice to see you, Julia. The Meddling Monk was such a good story. I loved it. Great. Watch it again. Come and join us in a couple of weeks' time for the review. We'll want to know what you think about it. Lex is saying to us he was a great Time Lord villain. Was he the early version of the Master? No. 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 He just fueled a mischief. That's what I love about him. Yeah. Uh, yeah. A, 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 if you've listened to the Master Plan audio, the bits he's in that doesn't exist on film, which is a real shame. I wish they had all his episodes. Uh, Me too, yeah. uh, but he, there's some lovely bits when him and Hartnell have a, a laughing match with each other about their plans, how to await each other, and just spend about five minutes laughing with each other. It's hilarious. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He does those He does those looks to camera, doesn't he? Where, so he's, he's got his back to the other protagonists and he's looking at the camera and his eyes are shifting and see where he's, he's thinking damn what do i do next what do i do next but i mean yeah. it's, it's a brilliant part yeah, i mean, I the, mean the sad thing now is if they brought that character back the <gasps> make it the, the mischievous nun. nun yeah that'll be like the that. nun it i think big finish really have done that already unfortunately yeah so oh yeah. you're kidding me don't tell me that that's nonsense well, isn't it? of course they have haven't they okay. the naughty nun Peter Peter Butterworth was absolutely brilliant at, at breaking the fourth wall, uh, yeah. but actually 
not not uh, spoiling it at all uh not just in uh as the monk but in um just like that uh but um as in all the carry-ons and all the rest of it he, he could just turn around acknowledge the audience and then go straight back into it without missing a beat yeah yeah, I wish I'd see. I wish I'd been able to see him live on stage in something, and I wish, or wish I'd been able to meet him, because I do. I, I just think everything he does, is, it just makes me laugh. He just has to come on in the Carry On films, and I'm already going. Yeah. You know, yeah. and there is that one that we were talking about there. Um, it's up the Kyber where he's playing. Um, what's his name, Brother Belcher? Mm -hmm. And it's the bit where he's he's he's, he's caught with the lady with the big jewelry, and. Yeah, and it's when he accidentally hits that prop, the lamp from the ceiling, <laughs> and he just goes with it, and he allows it to run round his chest. Yeah. <laughs> but the chemistry between him and Hartnell in Doctor Who, and we will talk about that more, of course, in, in The Time Meddler, it's just, it's you can watch it now so happily, can't you? It's just fabulous, those those two together. I, I The Time Meddler is one of my favourite Hartnell stories, definitely. Me I, I draw that story so much. Yeah. So in answer to you, Lex... No, he wasn't the master. The monk was the monk. He was a different a character maker. completely. And where the master, where, where the master just wants to control everything and destroy everything and just do that, he was just as Paul says. He was just wanting to have a laugh and change things for the sake of changing things and having fun. Yeah. Naughty, naughty monk. I was going to say a lot of people have described him a bit like Troughton a little bit. He's got a, a, yeah. a Troughton quality a little bit, which is a, which is a good thing. Well, it's a good thing. Doug yeah. is here. He's saying he's late to the party. Hi, Doug. Happy Easter and happy okay. April Fool's Day. Peter Butterworth is legendary as the meddling monk. Love him to bits. Yeah. And Ian, you know, what you were saying there, I'd hate them to bring back the monk today. Only he could play it, really. Mm. I reckon. He, he even made it into the comic really. strips with his. He did, I have to say, they did. Graham Garden played it on audio for Big oh. Finish, and he was brilliant. Like, okay. uh, he really was. Really? Yeah. I can't see it. Is Graham Garden still with us? He is, yes. All right. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm going to make it clear now. We're only talking about Doctor Who on television, really. We're not. No, I don't no, know. That's fine. I'm just giving an example of somebody else who played it who was I'll, quite I'll, I'll just tell the audience in case because they might go off on all sorts of stuff. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, we got. Uh, yes, we've got all that coming there. Thank you very much, everybody, for going and giving us all your chats. Keep it coming. Keep it coming. Keep it going. Yes, yeah, so that was uh, that's Peter Butterworth, and what a legend he was. I think it was it was just such a professional that he could bounce off anybody and yeah, he could bounce off a wall and make it funny. Couldn't he? And he's, he's there with in screaming is with Harry H. Corbett, isn't he? Is yeah. that right? Yeah. And, yeah. and you know, I mean, it's, I think that was the only film Corbett was in of the Harry carry on film. Yeah, yeah. 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 Butterworth's bouncing off him as if they're, they've been in about 15 films beforehand. It's just, they're in sync straight away. It's just, you know, and like you said, he is with Hartnell and everything. It's just like if you get two highly competent actors at the top of their game with a decent script, you get absolute magic, which is why we have absolute shite now. Because, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> a little bit of politics there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Can I just ask, I'm going to ask George to see if I know, was said James meant to play the Harry H. Corbett part in Scream. He was, but a heart, it was a heart attack that um, put Sid James out of action and Harry H. Right, Corbett yeah. was replacement casting. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, That's why the character still calls Sid. He's covered enough to yeah. return to the carry-ons. Um, Peter Rogers and Jerry Thomas were certainly thinking of Harry, having Harry H. Corbett as one of the main characters. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. Sid, I mean, Sid good recovered and he went back it's to work. Good, yeah. Oh, he's, he's brilliant at it. Yeah, yeah. you know, yeah. I, I, it would have been it would have been good for him because, you know, we got and stuck he, in the other thing for years, didn't he? With Steptoe. Well, mm -hmm. uh, he's also got a great relationship with Joan Sims because she's a real battle actor yes. going on screaming as well, which is fabulous. Mm -hmm. really is. <laughs> oh, but back to Joan Sims again. Joan Sims might feature quite a fit, uh, bit in this because yeah, a yeah. lot of her co-stars did cross over to Doctor Who, and we've got another one coming up right now. He says, and this, of course, is the legend that is Bernard Breslau. No. Um, and he's known to us in Doctor Who, of course, as playing the Ice Warrior. Look at these, and we, yeah. you know, we've talked about this before in, in our Ice Warriors review from last year. But I just still love that picture on the left hand side where he's going into the makeup there. Yeah, it still reminds me of when I was a kid because that picture was famous when we were kids. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Just in, it just really enthralled me that picture. Oh, look, that's how they do it. Wow. Mm -hmm. You know, 
absolutely wonderful. But he was another, I mean, he got the role there because, of course, he was a very tall bloke, which makes him so funny in the Carry On films because we've got a couple of pictures here. <laughs> <laughs> and again, completely versatile actor. Yeah, because he did all the he did he did all the, the, the straight stuff as well, didn't he? But here he is from um, a couple of the Carry On films, and it was always the Bernard Breslau. Poor, he always had to drag up, didn't he? He yeah. always. Do you remember as a nurse? Yeah, because he looked the most ludicrous when he did drag up. <laughs> yeah, powerful and brave. I think you meant to say. Yeah, is that the one that Carry On Girls? Hang on, don't Yeah, yeah. Sorry, Ian, what were you saying? I, he just he still looks more convincing than some of those these days. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, yeah. yeah, so it was Carry On Girls there Sorry, on the right. And what yeah. gets what, what's funny about this Paul and Carry On Girls, of course, is the fella that's actually quite interesting is Peter Butterworth's character, the old man. So, yeah, he's the industrial old man, isn't he? keeps pinching yeah. people's bottoms, that's right, yeah. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Doug is telling us here he, that he loves Bernard Breslau. I feel he had more hidden depths than he was allowed to show. Very probably, actually. Very probably, well, it goes to show. I um, mean, he, he took his work really seriously when he when he approached the part of Varga. He really, really went for it. And even mm -hmm. though you can't recognise him, he worked on the voice and everything, created the character, and it's a lovely performance. Completely mm -hmm. different from his carry on work. Yeah, yeah. Um, Dalek, I love you is worrying me. There have been rumours and theories the Time Muddler is in the new series as the mystery villain, but played by a woman this time. Stop it right now, Dalek, I love you, or you don't get any Easter egg. Very <laughs> naughty. Uh, Lex was telling us that it was amazing in Krull. Mm -hmm. I'd forgotten all about Krull. <laughs> Krull's great. Krull is criminally underrated. This is the man that likes like time lash. What? I was going to say that, but he beat me to it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I'm going to say, Dalek, I love you. You're very naughty this evening, but you're making me laugh. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, again, you know, look at this. So versatile, but some of the characters he was given in those films were, were more or less the same, but he did bring a sort of sparkle to them in each particular one. And it is a shame that we never saw him out of the Ice Warrior costume in Doctor Who, isn't it? You know, because he would yeah. have played a fantastic warrior or maybe a king or... Well, I think wasn't originally there might be Viking looking, the Ice Warriors, yeah. and they changed the way they looked. So he would have been quite good as a Viking, wouldn't he, if he was a Martian <laughs> Viking, if that's what it was going to be. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. Bernard Breslau had an interview, he was surprised and amazed when he went for his costume fitting. He got sent to a, a boatyard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that reading that somewhere. Yeah. It, it's the shot with the giant calipers measuring his legs and stuff. <laughs> amazing, isn't it? That's pretty funny. Isn't it? <laughs> you, you'd get a bit worried these days if somebody sent you to a boatyard for a costume fit. Uh, hello, I've seen that film. <laughs> no, brilliant. Uh, and I want to show this picture of him actually with Joan Sims. From a classic, from this is from, from Carry On Camping, and there he is in the back of the the the, yeah. the, the, the car there with Joni looking fabulous in that gorgeous 1970s top that everybody seemed to wear. Well, all the women, well, I don't know, <laughs> but it's that brilliant, that isn't it? He has got another connection with Doctor Who you're probably aware of that he was in the army game with William Hartnell back in the 50s. Mm -hmm. Yep, keep them coming, Paul. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. I mean, again, it, I'm going to go say it again. They all knew each other. It seemed like they all knew each other, mm -hmm. you know. Um, Phil, let's have another joke. Um, Ian, choose a number for Phil. Pick a number. Seven. Seven. <laughs> You're picking these AI gags, isn't you? Oh, way. Oh, here all we right. go. I can't wait for this one. <laughs> You Why can't. did the silence can't, yeah. go to therapy? Why did the what? Silence go to therapy. It's a new Doctor Who gag, this. I don't get it. Why did the silence go to therapy? Yeah. Because they kept forgetting what they were upset about. Oh. That's quite profound, though, numbers, isn't it? That's quite great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Dalek, I love you. Drawers and they are comedians, I think. AI. <laughs> well, we don't know about that one either. Carry on camping is the new Doctor Who era, says Dalek. I love you. I'm not going to argue. And Doug says, Didn't Bernard make a movie with John Pertwee, a Jekyll and Hyde thing? He did indeed. Yes, it right, was yeah. a hammer film mm. called The Ugly Duckling, yeah. and it was a comedy spoof of Jekyll and Hyde. Uh, Bernard Breslau was the top bill star, and John Pertwee actually played his dad in the film. 
There you go. I'm not, it's been I'm on not Talking gonna... Pictures TV a few times as well. Mm-hmm. Do you know, we're just all going to have to live on Talking TV from now on, everybody. And with yeah, the, yeah. Here's, the, here's a good April Fool for you. Just to remind you that today, the BBC licence fee in the UK has gone up by 6.6% here on the April the 1st. It's gone up from 159 to £169.50. So if you are paying for the licence fee, I hope you find it worth it. Money well spent. Quality has gone down 95%. <laughs> I thought it was more than that, 100%. I, I wouldn't worry, it'll be £3.50 before we know it. But uh... <laughs> Oh, God. Uh, but that's that's from today. So there's, there's another appropriate April Fool for you. Uh, hello to Michael Q, who is joining us. I haven't seen you before, Michael, so nice to, nice to see you here on Who's Views. You are very, very welcome. And he's saying, imagine Kenneth Williams as the doctor and Sid James as the master. <laughs> well, I like it, actually. I'd watch it. I'd see that film. I'd pay to see that film. <laughs> Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Oh, yes, Mavis Crit, my assistant, yes. <laughs> That'd be fabulous, wouldn't it? Yes. Oh, no, no, don't touch that knob of yes. Well, we know what the master's laugh would sound like, don't we? With Sid James. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you should get someone to dub that on Legopolis. That'd be brilliant, wouldn't it? <laughs> oh, you've got me thinking now. <laughs> yeah, there we go. That's what... Can we do that on AI? <laughs> Uh, along those lines, there is a brilliant clip on YouTube where somebody has redubbed Darth Vader as Kenneth Williams yeah. using lines. That is genius. And it's hysterically funny. I'm going to have to look that one up. Can you yeah, imagine? I have to Google that. It's <laughs> almost as funny as Dave Prowse, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Back in <my> star. Yeah. <laughs> All right, my lover. Yeah. <laughs> I am your father. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> you throw me now. Listen. <laughs> There were occasions, of course, arguably, where Doctor Who may have had missteps when casting some of the comic geniuses that we produced here in the UK through our television and films. Arguably, I'm going to say, because, of course, we've all got different opinions. In my humble opinion, this next casting was a misstep and actually also such a shame Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Go on in. Yeah, as um as the caretaker from Paradise Towers, I think Richard Bryas is or was such a versatile actor. I mean, obviously known very much for good life and comedy. Yeah. But was such a versatile actor. Um, he could have done so much more. Uh, but unfortunately, I think it was the right actor, but at the wrong time. I think Doctor Who was very much struggling for its survival at that point. It had, you know, literally a couple of more years to run and it was trying to make impact probably more on the actor choices that were appearing alongside the main lead rather than anything else because obviously it was up against Coronation Street, which was getting 15, 16, 17 million at that point every week. So, you know, to kill Doctor Who off, they put it up against it. And it's still got some ratings that are higher than today. But, um, you know, I mean, it put, did it pull some like five or six million uh, at, at one point against Coronation about six, Street? About six million, I think, for, for Parts of Paradise Towers. In case you don't know, of course, this is legendary actor and com- uh, comic Richard Bryars seen here in The Good Life. Now, The Good Life went for years and years and years and was a cult favourite, really. Um, with the public and its own fan base, which is still around today. You can still see it today, although, again, trimmed. They've edited it again for Mm. this new modern audience that they all seem to be infatuated with. Absolute. I I think it's a shame that he didn't play it slightly differently. I mean, I I saw him do King Lear um, when Ken Branagh produced it, and there was a tour of that. It was fabulous. Uh, But the... um, um, I think he's not too bad in the first couple of episodes because it's quite a comic performance. It's when it becomes zombified in episode four, that's when it's really awful, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It, yeah. it's yeah. cringy at that point. But of course, yeah. you mentioned Good Life, whereas with Felicity Kendall, also Doctor Who. Mm-hmm. Oh. Um, also, Richard Bryars was married to Anne Davis, who played Jenny in The Dalek Invasion of Earth. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Mm-hmm. Well, let's show him, as as we'll know him, as the caretaker from Paradise Towers. This was him here. Um Interesting costume, interesting choice of makeup. Um, we all know what he was getting at there. Yeah. And he admitted that, didn't he? But yeah, I mean, you know, the first the first couple of performances, yes, but when you look at Paradise Towers now, that's a really 
bold script. It's actually a really good, scary story, which you couldn't have produced in that time because you had a BBC studio. Today, you would actually go to a rundown old tower block, wouldn't you? And film it in a rundown tower block and scare the, you know, well, scare imagine, if, imagine if it was done during season 13 or 14 at very dark, very sinister yeah. episode. That would be amazing. Yeah. And the robot cleaners would be different now. Yeah, I think if the cl the cleaners were one of the things that they just weren't scary, were they? They were just sort of like trundling white things with a claw attachment that really yeah wouldn't do anything. Whereas if they were more if they were more humanoidy and fast moving and sinister, then it could have been an entirely different story. But I have and to it, say it, the ra the Raston Warrior robot would have a great cleaning device, don't you think? <laughs> <laughs> I actually really like the story of Paradise Towers. If you ever read the Target novel, it's a cracking read when Stephen White actually shows you how it could have been done. But again, we all know the limits of Doctor Who at that particular point as well. I reckon it's one of these things um, I always say, like it's like with Bob Baker's Nightmare in Eden. If it was done today, it would be a proper hard-hitting drama, or should be. We don't know what's coming, but it should be a hard-hitting drama. And Paradise Towers, I just I was disappointed with Mr. Bryce's performance in this because for me. I, I really liked him as an actor. I'd seen him in uh, a play in, um, I think it was Manchester, uh, before he did Doctor Who, and he was superb. He really got my attention. And because I was coming off the back of Ever Decreasing Circles and The Good Life, I only knew him for the comic stuff. So to see him on stage doing this really, really stellar performance, and then it was announced he's going to be in Doctor Who, I was so excited. And then I saw the episode. I wish he just played it a little bit more contained. There's yeah. one performance that always makes me laugh about Richard Rise. Again, going back to Branagh, he's in Branagh's Frankenstein. He plays the old man. Yeah. Uh, that's been parodied wow. to death by Gene Hackman and Mel Brooks' uh, Young Frankenstein. It's very hard to take seriously, but De Niro's the monster and Richard Briars, two uh, really different actors in the same film with the same scene. It's just really odd to watch if you get a chance to see them. <laughs> I bet it is. I bet it is. Lex is actually saying to us that he would have been a great Doctor Who. I've, I've, I've known people, Lex, over the years that have said the same thing because he had that ability to be what Tom Baker would have said was mysterious. Um, and I think he proved that in some of the roles as well. I, I think as a, a middle-aged man, yeah, I think I agree. I think he could have been a very interesting Doctor and putting a spin on that with his dramatic side and his comic side and having to develop an action side which we never saw in his career apart from possibly is shakespeare hmm, do you know what i mean mm. um, I do watch, um when when right at the very end of uh, paradise towers where they're trying to kill him and um he's struggling with pex with that stick of dynamite and he pushes him away and he's just holding the dynamite and then Pex yeah. runs at him yeah. just as he falls back the look on his face you can just imagine he's going Shit! Well, it's a, the, the, bit the, the bit with the dynamite is like the Wiley Coyote, isn't it? In the cartoon, yeah. I think it's very bizarre. The look, the look yeah. on his character's face, though, it, it, it's it's probably the best bit for me, which is no, yeah. um, no credit to Richard Bryars, I suppose, in that respect, because it's probably not intended. But it was it was wasted in that, I think. I, it was great to have him in Doctor Who. I just wish. I don't know. I wish it had been either a, a more contained performance uh, and maybe the director should have controlled him a bit more. And certainly John Nathan Turner should have clamped down on him a bit more um, tried, or yeah. a different script. Tried. One, I think he tried to do it. He? Well, Nathan, Nathan Turner did say things like, are you going to play it like that? <laughs> Which yeah. doesn't help the situation with any actor because they just go, yes, actually, I know yeah. what I'm doing, love. Um, Mark is asking, were many of these actors from the rep tradition? All of them would have been. Yeah, yeah. In those days, yeah, they would have all been busy with the uh, rep and what have you doing that, so absolutely. And Doug, I agree with the panel. Richard Bryars was not good in Paradise Towers, but I still love him in The Good Life. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Um, Julia is saying to us, I saw Richard Bryars as Malvolio in Twelfth Night, and he was amazing. Yeah. Did anybody see him in that? I saw that. Yeah, it was really good. Yeah. Okay. Fabulous. And of course, he did a voiceover for Rhubarb. <laughs> <laughs> okay. One of his, for everybody that doesn't know, that was a cartoon that was an animation for children back in the 70s. 
and um, he did the he did the narration for it. It was absolutely brilliant. We all loved he, he that one. Rhubarb, oh, and, and I forgot did... about this. Oh yes, of course, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I forgot about this. He was Henry Parker in the Torchwood story, A Day in the Death. I don't remember it. What was that about? I can't remember the plot at all. What's the one? Just asking for a friend. <laughs> <laughs> mm. no, I don't remember. I don't remember Torchwood at all. A Day in the Death. You see, he was in that one. I didn't realise he was in that. I don't remember it at all. But thank you for that. Wonderful. Um, okay, so we've got. Did you have? Do you remember seeing it? Uh, I, I vaguely, vaguely yeah, remember vaguely well. that he was in it, but I couldn't have told you what episode and I couldn't have told you what happened at all. No, I, I don't remember. Well, thanks for reminding us on that one, mate, but I don't remember that one at all. <laughs> um, let's, have a, let's have another think here. Um, who else can we go to here now? Let's come up a little bit. Um, to another classic actress, actually. We're going to talk about an actress now. And it's this lady here, and it's actually from the same period we've just been talking to about Richard Bryars, but this is one of my favourite actresses. Peggy Mount. Oh. Oh. Peggy Mount. Who remembers Peggy Mount? Oh, yeah. She's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Yeah. yeah. Um, this was Peggy Mount, the legend that was Peggy Mount here. Known for a generation, I, my generation, for this. You're only yeah. young twice. And there she is on the right with another legend of the comic circuit, Pat Coombs, who never actually made it into Doctor Who. Strangely, yeah. you know, she never got there, did she, guys? Uh, looking for that picture, I'm surprised they're not in Paradise Towers, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> well, you may know Peggy, actually, because the Doctor Who she was in, and it was a very interesting sort of long cameo, wasn't it, guys? But it was this one. It was the greatest show in the galaxy from yeah. season 25, where she plays the fruit stall holder, as I'm going to call her, because I can't remember what the part was, but fruit stall holder. And in that one, she still was playing that sort of gruff battle axe type don't mess with me character, wasn't she? Even the doctor was a little bit like, just eat your nice fruit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, what were they eating? I'm not quite sure. It looked horrible. But, uh... <laughs> there was a terrific Peter Sellers film called The Naked Truth. Uh, which Peggy Mount appeared in, uh, and she actually played Joan Sims's mum in it, uh, where she was trying to um, uh, dispose of somebody who was blackmailing her. Oh, when you say dispose, <laughs> 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 um, um, Lex is also saying to us here, she was an amazing character. Yeah, again, another character actress and a huge caliber. I mean, Peggy was around again when we were kids. But as I say, I just knew her as being that rather sort of brashy nan type character that you didn't mess with, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, I don't know about you guys, what your memories of Peggy Mount were. I've, I've, um, I'm aware that she's um, done some stuff with Sid James. You see, Sid James is a favourite of mine. Mm -hmm. uh, I love his Hancock's Half Hour stuff as well. And um, I know that Peggy Mount did... I think two or three series of George and the Dragon, Dragon. with her. Mm -hmm. That's um, right, yeah. 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 Um, yeah. And uh, I've, I'm pretty certain I've seen some clips of that on, on the tube of you, of who. Yeah. But, um, yeah. yeah, Peggy Mount was just one of those comedy actresses that was always there when you were growing up through the 60s and 70s. Yeah, always. Well, the, there's one episode of George and the Dragon where Tom Baker has a very brief scene with Sid. There is. That's right, yeah, yeah. There yeah. is. Now, we, we spoke about this scene on our Tom Baker birthday special back in January. Yeah. And it cracks me up every time we talk about it. It's superb. Absolutely <laughs> I'm superb. going again now just thinking about this. Yeah. Um, I've got, well, and it cracked me up then. It cracks me up every time I see it. And it's cracking me up again now. Um, so, listen, Paul, just explain this. Well, this... Oh, has he gone? Have we lost him? Oh, oh hang on a second. Oh, He's coming back. There we go. Yeah. Are you there? Hello, yeah. Hello, yeah. So anyway, so as I was saying, Tom is a, a member of British Rail staff there and he's a train guard. And Peggy Mount says, uh, um, how long will the next train be? And Tom says, 120 feet. <laughs> <laughs> And look at her face when he's... <laughs> and he goes off laughing maniacally like he's just Doctor Who. It's fantastic. <laughs> and he, again, it's just Sid James. 
<laughs> Every time we talk about this particular thing, it, it, I mean, Tom is just there for such a short space of time, but between the three of them, it's brilliant comic timing. It's lovely. It is lovely. It, yeah. It's just yeah. Wonderful performance. But look at her face when he says that to her. <laughs> 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 I love it. It's just brilliant. But again, to have her back into Doctor Who, do we reckon she was funny though in Doctor Who? Did you play it straight? I think she was just playing herself, to be honest. <laughs> I don't think she was trying to be funny. I think she was just playing a battle axe character, which by that point, you know, I mean, I don't know. I don't think it was that long after that that, that she passed away. Um, I honestly couldn't say, George, I don't know if you. You know, you you know a lot of stuff like this, but I mean, she was there in what was that, eighty six, eighty seven? I, I, without checking, I think it was around eighty seven, eighty eight that she left the party. Right. Okay. So yeah. very, very much close to being one of the last mm -hmm. roles that she'd have ever played. And yeah. by that point, she's well, well typecast as a battle axe character. Oh yeah. So I think, yeah. I think, like you said, Paul, she was probably just playing it for her straight. Yeah. Yeah, I know that John Nathan Turner was delighted to get her. Um, I mean, he loved these people. He was so fond of them and he understood the variety aspect. And we all know that Jane T himself was a, a huge variety type person, you know, and uh, it, it, a lot of the time people that were coming into 80s Doctor Who, as we will see through the show, were his idea. You know, they were his idea a lot of the time. Uh, and Peggy Mao, he was delighted that she was in. I, I know that because he told me that. He was thrilled that he got to meet with her and work with her. Was JNT wearing Tom's season 18 costume in that photo? <laughs> probably, could probably. Easily be, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on, there's no question marks on the collar. I think you're wrong. <laughs> um, but brilliant. So that's Peggy Mount there. And to this day, uh, one of my favourite comics. In fact, a lot of these are my favourite comics actually, because we grew up with them. But yeah. it was just that you know those whole thing, that whole that series with Pat Coombs went for five seasons. I remember it. Yeah, I didn't realise it was going so long because as a kid you don't really notice, do you? Unless you're watching just Doctor Who. You know the things were on all the time. But that was that was back then. That was a huge run. Yeah, it was really popular, and um, my granny loved it. I remember she used to adore Peggy Mount and Pat Coombs. Yeah. It, it was brilliant. This was uh, it was about these two ladies who were best buddies, and they were in a care home, yeah, <laughs> retirement home, yeah. which which is still funny. I think to this day, <laughs> you probably will be able to do it now. Uh, there was somebody else that John Nathan Turner um, allegedly insisted on getting into the role, and this could be um, into the show rather. This uh, casting could be a misstep. Ah, uh, warp drive. Yeah. <laughs> We've come out with warp lives. drive. Right. <laughs> this, of course, is another legend. This is Beryl Reed, everybody. Uh, another incredibly accomplished comic actress as well as actually. But I think she did more comic style roles than she did the straight roles. But you'll know her uh, better for Earthshock. Um, 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 yeah, so um, I don't know what to say. She, she did some... <laughs> She did some really hard hitting roles, though. I mean, what? Oh, she, she did. Sister George. Of course, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Well, that was a famous one. But I think mm -hmm. from a public's point of view, though. Yeah. Oh, I yeah. agree with I, you. Yeah, certainly. Yeah. I, I remember from when I was a wee boy with Mooncat at lunchtimes, mm -hmm. this big green cat, which ev eventually evolved into Roland Rat um, through David. But, you know, it was, uh, I don't know if any of you remember that. There was a big cat, and, meow, meow, and he came yeah, from the yeah. space. Yeah. And she she lived with him. I think I to be fair, it's a handicap for Beryl Reed that she's got red hair in this. It doesn't really. It looks a bit odd, doesn't it? You know, it's a theme. Um, yeah, it's a theme. It was the eighties. Everyone had ginger hair. <laughs> I didn't. I was blonde. Tardis it, travels. It, it was Beryl was slightly miscast in Earth Shock. Slightly miscast. I think she just about gets away with it. You know, you get used to her, and you can suspend disbelief. I think she just about pulls it off. I think. She mm. was she was very very good as a bordello madam in the assassination bureau. If you've mm. ever seen yeah. that, yeah, <laughs> I don't think I have actually. No. It's good, watch out for Roger Gard, who's got two lanes in it. I think indeed, uh, yeah. yeah so. I think. Oh. yeah. You see, I only knew her for the comedy as well, um, and then she turns up in Doctor Who. I, I sort of went with it at the time, but I can see why Peter Davison was a little bit sort of tense. Um, 
when I watched it, the one thing it seemed to me it was very obvious she was reading off cue cards. Mm. Now, I wanted to bring that up because I think I was wondering if that was my imagination. So it obviously isn't. No, yeah. it, to me, it's very obvious she's reading off cue cards. Oh, because her eye line doesn't quite match with everybody else. And you can see her eyes moving across the words. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They were, well, let's face it, they were very complicated lines, weren't they? You know, for her. Um, she's probably they... looking at one there. <laughs> <laughs> That, that was supposed to be a monologue to camera. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Well, compare. I mean, you can't really compare these sort of things, but compare the fact that she's supposed to be a big, tough captain, Beryl Reed in that sort of role. She had a Carry On connection as well. She was Mrs. Valentine in Carry On Emmanuel. Oh yeah, which we don't talk about. Thanks. <laughs> Was Joan Sims in that, just to get Joan Sims into it again? She was. She was Mrs. Dangle, the housekeeper. And There's Suzanne Daniels is going to get a little Doctor Who connection. Yes. Really, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Not many of them were in that last film, though, because some of them walked out on, on reading the script. So, but that's, that's an urban myth. There's actually more of the gang in Emmanuel than England, the previous one. England was a bit dodgy as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so we got... But yes, yeah, so what do you, let's have a look. What do you think of Beryl Reed then when she turned up? Mark is quoting to us, if I'm late delivering my cargo, I not only lose my bonus. That's one of the lines I'm thinking, oh, look, she's reading. Have another look at that. When you watch Earthshock again, just have a look and see what you think. Because uh, I actually thought I was imagining it. But there we go. And Garbage, when she was reading cue cards, did she say, now walk over to control panel and sit down? Possibly. <laughs> no, she didn't read the stage directions, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> that, that'd be quite funny, though, wasn't it? It would be funny, yeah. yeah. That, you know. No, but uh, well, yes. Yeah, we did that a bit, didn't he, with the technical stuff? Yeah. He had little stickers dotted around everywhere, didn't he? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> now that you've mentioned him, and he's your this is your one of your favorite, let's mention him. Pertwee himself, the mighty Pertwee, yeah. Also known for his comic roles as well. And as we mentioned, he ha he was in a few carry-on films, and I've got a couple of the clips from um, from this from the <laughs> right. Um I love the one on the left, which is Carry On Cleo. And Pertwee in that oh, yeah. makes a brief, brief, brief cameo, if you like, again, as he did in these things. And he's just brilliant. And he, he delivers such lines such as like, oh, gather around and have a butcher. Yeah. Oh, I yeah. love it. And he's supposed to be an Egyptian, yeah. whatever it was, stage. Yeah, I'm glad you told us which films they were. Because if you look at John Pertwee's eyes, they could be straight from uh, the Silurians or, or the uh, part four spearhead where he gets strangled by the Nestine. He's got that wonderful <laughs> pulling faces, you know, that he does. <laughs> He is. He's got that lovely uh, comic face here. But this was the brilliant thing about Pertwee. I mean, there must have been a bit of a shock when Pertwee was announced as Doctor, as the Doctor, you know, coming in after Troughton. Well, yeah, he was just, he was just known for comedy, wasn't he, really? He was. Um, yeah, from the Navy Lark onwards. Yeah. And, I mean, it's, it's that, I love that photo where you see him in that film with Hartnell. You know, the oh, yeah. Well, in a gentleman, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, I, I couldn't remember the name of the film, so thank you for that because I, I would not have been able to place it. But I love the I love the photo. But um, I mean, radio was definitely you know obviously the famous uh, Navy Lark, um, which I adore as much as Hancock's Half Hour. But of course, he had other stuff, Puffney Post Office, which apparently nothing exists of, which is a real shame. But he, he had a huge list of radio credits, mainly for funny stuff and everything. And of course it goes right back to time in the entertainment branch of, um, of the forces as well, all the way back. Yeah. yeah. He did the Navy Lark concurrently with Dr. Who, didn't he? For he a little did, while yeah. he did, didn't he? Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. The 50s until about 1976, 77, I think. Mm -hmm. So it would have been entirely through his Dr. Who run. Definitely. Yeah. But I mean, we mentioned just, just as an aside, cause I'm that sad that way. Um, Obviously, we mentioned Peter Butterworth, who was an absolute war hero. Mm -hmm. But um, John Pertwee had his own uh, close calls as well, blown up twice, woke up in a mortuary once, surrounded by dead bodies, and was drafted off HMS Hood just yeah. before it set sail on its final voyage, where it was sent to the bottom. Almost am, I right in, and, am I right in thinking he worked with Ian Fleming during the war as well? I think he did, yes. Yeah, that was in his book, wasn't it? It was one of the books mm -hmm. he wrote. I think it was the one. 
it was the one before the one with David. Was it Moon Boots? Was it something like that? Moon Boots and Dinner Suits. That's the yeah. one. I'm sure it's yeah. mentioned in that one. But that's why he was as hard as nails as well. Yeah. And that, and that's why it's because he had this reputation as being a comic and a funny guy. It's such a twist. People must have been really shocked to see him playing the doctor straight because he's got rid and of that humorous side, doesn't he? And you know, it's, it's just amazing, really. It's a better fresh air. I love these performances as the, as the doctor. It's great, fantastic stuff. Yeah. And talking about biographies, if you've not heard an audience for John Pertwee, the audio oh. of, his, of his little show, one man show he did, I recommend it if you've not got it. It's really good. Yeah, absolutely. Second that. Occasionally, though, occasionally, in as, as the naval art went on, you know, you get into something like series 10 or something like that. He's got more and more parts. Initially, he was just Chief Petty Officer Pertwee. Yeah. And he was bouncing off mainly Ronnie Barker. And in those times, they were very much a double act. But yeah. as he went on and Ronnie Barker left, Pertwee got to do more and more voices. And there was one where he would just constantly uh, uh, scramble yeah. over words. And yeah. it comes out in, um, in The Sea Devils when they're on that um, early on episode two, I think, where they're trying to get the attention of the, of the helicopter. Yeah, yeah. He rewired yeah. the radio and he, he's, he's supposed to give coordinates. And he says, yeah, 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 where are we? And yeah. that is just a little bit of Navy like character coming through. Yeah, yeah. in every now and again. Love it. He, he also uses one of his Navy Lark voices as a radio announcer in Inferno That's as right. well, doesn't he? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He, he, he can do kind yeah. of Lord Ho Ho, isn't he? And that, yeah. It's a bit kind of like that, isn't it? That's right. <laughs> Again, um, just I mean, I mean, also from the sort of musical type family background as well. He knew his trade, didn't he? Back then, oh, yeah. yeah. And I was able to turn his hand. Doug is telling us here in the chat as well that he has just recently watched Pertwee and Carry On Cowboy as the death short sighted sheriff, and it's brilliant. It's so brilliant, Doug. That role in Cowboy it annoys me. That character grates on me because it's just everywhere, isn't it? Really, he always plays the same character yeah. in Carry On Columbus, doesn't he? It? It's almost identical, mm -hmm. isn't it? The death, death uh, uh, Spanish, <laughs> Spanish ambassador, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah, uh, Pertwee was the bond of Doctor Who gadgets, action, and suave. It was very Fleming, says Dalek. I love you. Uh, it was, wasn't it? But that was the contrast, and it's amazing, really, because as I say, people would, might have been expecting more of a Trout Nest type performance, but he didn't, and that's why he was really successful in the role because he yeah. twisted it again and said, "No, I'm going to do it this way." Wonderful well, performance, we all know. But the first indication that public ever saw, everybody must have thought that he was going to do it for comedy because. His first photo call was him messing around with that Yeti costume. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but that, that was the intention of, of Derek Sherwin and Peter Bryant, wasn't it, to make him comical and a mm -hmm. folk singer. And then it all changed when Barry arrived, wasn't it? And they played it the way John wanted to do it, wasn't it? Yeah, because they, they yeah. settled, wasn't it, really, yeah. on, on this sort of stuff. They, they all came together. You mentioned it early in the chat, who viewers. We need to mention it again as well, because he had a second huge success, didn't he? And this was something else that we all grew up with. Wurzel Gummidge himself. What... A genius performance as the infamous Scarecrow. I don't know about you lot, but we were reading Wurzel Gummidge's primary school. You know, when you sat around your teacher at the end yeah. of each day and your teacher would sing, uh, would uh, read to you a book. Wurzel Gummidge was one of those books that was read to us. And just a few short weeks after we'd finished the story, Pertwee comes along in this first series and I don't know about you lot, but I was just taken from it from moment one. And he had everything in there. He showed every ability and all his range, wasn't he, Pertwee? Because he was able to be serious. He was able to be terrifying, actually, as that scarecrow. He was able to be funny. He had all the funny voices. He had all the different characters when you took his head off and became another one. <laughs> I don't know if you've seen, if you've seen uh, Wars of Gummies Down Under. Uh, but oh. I think the, the original series is quite dark, but the, la the stuff he did in New Zealand is even darker. Uh, and it's brilliant. I really recommend oh. it. Yeah. Years and years back, I saw the World's Gummidge stage show, and parts of that were very dark. I mean, I, I've got vivid memories. You know, there were young children literally screaming and crying at parts of it, and you know, ten minutes later, they were rocking with laughter. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's a great YouTube clip of um, very, very, very 1980s budding journalist interviewing Pertwee between shows and that stage show as World's mm -hmm. Gummidge. It's quite. It's quite. A nice little snippet. Mm. Thought I'd throw that out there. You know. No, please do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Timescales has just joined us. Hello to you. Hope everything is well in San Francisco. Um, and Lex is saying to us, "Where's my cup of tea and a slice of cake?" <laughs> Which the nation was saying for years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
you know that, that episode called that is very dark. I think Billy Conley's in that one as well, and there's like a scarecrow ball, I think, in that one. And the people that turn up in that are really scary. That all these different <laughs> scarecrow heads. If you're a kid, you must have had nightmares. It's almost as scary as Doctor Who. No, do you know what? I don't think we do because we were made of stern stuff. And I used to love it when Wurzel would pull the head off yeah. and put it somewhere safe. And he'd always invariably forget where he put it. And then the body would walk around trying to find which head do I have. Ooh, I'll have, I'll have my intelligence head. <laughs> and I thought it was played brilliantly. I love all that. But, you know, I, I, I think the younger ones today, I think Phil's lads would get it for a start. I think the teenagers and the 20-year-olds would freak. Probably, yeah. They're well, they wet the bed anyway, don't they? So it won't make much difference. Put it. <laughs> they need a trigger warning before the program. I'm sure it's on Talking Pictures TV. I bet there's a disclaimer before it starts. If you're I'm watching this and you are, a, if you're watching this and you are a teenager or a 20 year old, defend yourselves. Come on, get into the chat. Come and tell us what. Tell us we're talking nonsense because we're judging you. I have yeah, to say, I didn't the, Mc, the Mackenzie yeah. Crook remake. I wasn't that keen on that. I have to say, but yeah, Not it's seen. okay, but it's too yeah. glossy and it doesn't yeah. have that. That that's. In the original one with John's one, I mean, he was very much involved with the production of it as well, wasn't he? Mm, yeah. So he, he was able to say things like, you know, oh, this should be a little bit scary. He, he brought the little things in. I remember him saying that in the convention, how he was able to just say, right, OK, I'm going to play that that way and I'm going to play that one. No one really stopped him. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Ian, you could probably confirm this for me, but am I right in saying that Pert, we actually had the screen rights to Wurzel Gummidge and it was a long held project of his? I'm not That's sure right, yeah. whether he held the rights, but it was a huge long-running project for him. He he was very much sometimes the sole driving force to get it yeah. made. I, I seem I, to remember hearing one time he discovered the only way he was going to get it done was if he obtained the rights to do it, and he right. went into partnership with, was it James Hill who directed it? James Hill, um, yeah. James Hill. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. So yeah. He, he, got the, he got the TV rights, uh, the option for the TV rights, and then he went round various TV companies. Apparently, the BBC turned it down. Yeah, yeah they did. What a surprise! Heard. What a stupid surprise! Yeah, yeah. It yeah. It, it, it's it's typical, though, isn't it? I think mm, it was Southern yeah. that, mm -hmm. that took it on, and yeah, know, TVS to them at yeah. the end of the day. And it was also Pertwee that managed to get the money from, uh, well, part of him, the, his partners, got the money from Australia eventually. That's why they had to go down under with it, you know, mm -hmm. to get it done down there, uh, and therefore starting. A trend, really, <laughs> from British people going over there. Um, yes, thank you for that, Doug. He said, you believe Pertwee is a man of action, the smartest person in the room, apart from Peter Cushing. He was my doctor. His gurning does make me smile, though. He had that lovely rubbery face, though, didn't he, John, where he could do all that wonderful thing. Sylv's got it, too, which is uh, which is really, really good. Um, let's have a look. What else we got here? The first episode, says Lex, was when he was in the caravan roof staying in raining. Where, where's me cake at night? It was dark and funny yeah. night scene. That's right. I love that first episode because it gripped me as a boy. Yeah. I'm going to watch yeah. this every Sunday. It was Sunday night, about five o'clock where I lived. And uh, Mark says, very few actors get three standout characters that the public remembers 40 years mm -hmm. on. Good point, Mark. Mm. It is, isn't it? Yeah. Um, before we come to talk about a co-star of Pertwee's in Wurzel Gummidge, let's go to Phil and have another joke. So, Paul, can you uh, call out a number from Phil, our resident joker? Now, I can't remember what I've already had, so let's uh, see. Five and two. seven. He wants a number two. Number two. Go on, then. There's this a gag in there already, number two. AI, <laughs> unfortunately. Okay, so this isn't an AI joke, okay. Sadly. Oh, Great to hear Doctor Who's new Herb Rage has won awards. He's a Time Lord. Time spelt T H. Are you sure that's not AI? Are you putting that as AI? That one, actually, courtesy of the Beano. Oh, right, okay. Oh, that's quite good then from the Beano. That's the I level think... of comedy I've aimed for. That's the highbrow <laughs> of the... Is that, how recent from the Beano was that, Phil? Is it, is it a recent the one internet. or an old one? Or... The internet. The internet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The internet web of the Beano. <laughs> that's ridiculous. I'm here all night. Still got one more. <laughs> we'll be coming back. Bar mitzvahs. <laughs> <laughs> that would be frightening. Yeah, so we'll go back to John's time as Wurzel Gummidge, and he did have a co-star that actually, we, we do say, also was in Doctor Who, although she was in it fleetingly, but I really do want to mention the wonderful and fabulous Barbara Windsor. Mm. Um, again, another wonderful actress of her time because she was, again, versatile. Yes, she was known and then sort of punished, if you like, in inverted commas, for the carry-ons. 
but her early work was stunning absolutely serious stuff and it was it was interesting isn't it because when eastenders came along in a, what was that 1986 85 somewhere around about that i remember an interview with her in a sunday paper i remember those days where you used to get a, a sunday glossy magazine with your paper and there was an interview with her and she was she came across as raging in the interview because at that point the BBC had said they really wanted unknowns in EastEnders so that the public would take to it more than names. And she yeah, phoned, yeah, she'd phoned Julia at the mm -hmm. BBC to say, I'm, I'm available. And they'd said no. And it took her some like 20 years before they took her into EastEnders. And that relaunched her career again and made her famous again. It's a real shame because she'd done, prior to the Carry On film, she was part of a... Uh, John Littlewood's theatre workshop yeah, and that's a lot of really, yeah, uh, yeah. really kind of big, we became big actors later on. So there's a lot of really, really straight acting and then it's all yeah. the carry on stuff that got her identified as the kind of bon blom uh, bombshell type person. You know what I mean? Well, apparently Littlewood had said to her, don't do another one of those carry ons and she did. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, if you watched Arrows Can't Sing where she gives a yeah. completely straight performance, uh, it, it, it's a terrific character study. Mm. She was such um, such a, a wonderful actress, but you know, at the time when we were growing up with her, I don't know about you guys as well, but all I knew her for because all the work she could get was related to the Carry Ons. Mm -hmm. So she even did those highlight things with Kenneth, who was having yeah, the yeah. same sort of typecasting mm -hmm. problems. Jones yeah. Jim's had the same problem, you know, all the typecasting stuff. It's just a shame as well because the Renaissance did happen, but for some of them, it was too late. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, the same I mean, she appeared in Dad's Army as well in an episode of the second series as a as a um um a kind of she was um in a kind of uh sort of show and she was performing uh, stunts with guns and stuff. She was, she was mm -hmm. playing like a an assistant to a, a magician, that kind of thing in, in the show as well. And she she mm -hmm. played the, the same character she played in the Kyon film effectively, you know, in, in Dad's Army mm -hmm. in about sixty eight. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I think she's remembered more than not just a, a very fine actress and comedy actress, but in, in the best sense of the word, she was also a personality. Mm. Mm. She was. She was. And, I'm, I'm, and thank goodness they had all those silly shows in the 70s, like Celebrity Squares, mm -hmm. Blankety Blank and all that. You know, those sort of things, because that's where they, the chat shows. I mean, Williams, for example, was on every chat show going yeah. all the time because that was his work. Barbara Windsor was more or less in that, but she actually had a life outside show business as well, didn't she? That she was really trying to put up. Yeah. Another one... I don't want to go too much into her personal life because it's a terrible, sad story. Um, but, I mean, yeah, she played Saucy Nancy as TARDIS Travels is telling us here. I loved Saucy Nancy, and I actually preferred Saucy Nancy to Eunice Stubbs' wonderful Aunt Sally. And those, do you remember the episode where the two of them were fighting over the scarecrow over Wurzel? They were actually going for it. And I just said, this is great. I love this. Wow. I remember it vividly. I don't know about you guys, if you remember the, the relationship. Yeah, I remember Sa Saucy Nancy was attached to the front of the ship, wasn't she? To the ship, yeah. 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 And <laughs> wasn't she on, like, casters at one point? As yes. She was tumbling down this, the street. Yeah, I remember that, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And she uh, loved Wurzel, whereas Aunt Sally just tolerated him mm -hmm. until the other woman came along. And then she sort of like, oh, yeah, no, you must come with me. Stupid scarecrow. We should have gone I off used to love Eunice Stubbs' kind of awkward walk she did, that kind of... Yeah. Like she needed oil. It was a great performance. It was very funny. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Kirsty's saying here in the chat, hit the like button and subscribe or get out my pub. <laughs> <laughs> that is brilliant. Now, but can you remember, who viewers, how she got into Doctor Who? The wonderful, the glorious, the beautiful. Um, actually, I'm going to say it about all of these. They're all much missed, these people. You're not going to see the like of these people uh -huh. ever again. But what was Bab saying? Can you remember the episode, everyone? Army of Ghosts. Yeah. 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 And it was, yeah. again, it was, um, for me, it was a bit disappointing because we'd heard Barbara Windsor was going to be in Doctor Who. We'd heard, that, uh, uh, you know, of all these things. And I just thought, how? How is she, what's she going to play? And then it turns up as that cameo where she's playing the, the EastEnders character on a television. Yeah. What a waste. Yeah, it was. She would have um, played, actually, quite a good villain. I think one thing that's well worth watching it's on YouTube. If you haven't seen it was um, way back in the eighties, uh, Kenneth Williams stood in for Terry Wogan on his chat show for mm. a week. And uh, Kenny yeah. interviewed Barbara on the chat show and they reminisced about their time together in the carry ons. Well, and they tried to, I remember watching yeah. that live 
And as usual, Kenneth was trying to twist it about, oh, yeah, it's all about me, yeah, you know. And, and Barbara's like, nah. <laughs> and, she's, and, she's got, and, and there's one thing, that, do you remember that conversation where he's trying to talk? And just, I'm not talking about that. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, just, it's brilliant if you haven't seen it because it's two mates forgetting there's a bloody mm -hmm. audience and yeah. 20 million people watching them live. Right. Yeah. Uh, Barbara Windsor remember being dragged through the uh, the green painted mud by the bikini and uh, shooting carry on camping and all that sort of thing. The pair of them falling about laughing at it. <laughs> yeah, I love that story that they painted the grass because it was winter. That was brilliant. Yeah, it was yeah. that that was shot in the first week of November, and yeah, they literally sprayed sprayed the grass green and stuck yeah, false leaves on the trees. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Kirsty's saying to us that she only ever saw Barbara with the Cybermen and that, that very small cameo. I, I yeah. can't tell you guys how gutted I was. And I thought, oh, is that, that's it. That's going to be it. I yeah. thought she was going to come in as something to do with Torchwood by that point, you know. Mm. Um, she's going to come as a big bold character in the white coat or something. Or oh. well, Unfortunately, having that EastEnders appearance dates that episode so much as well, which is such a shame. But... This is something we've talked about, isn't it? Because yeah, when you yeah. when you do that, Mr. T. Davis, when you do that and you put modern day references in, your show dates immediately, and it yeah. does date that episode. You can, you, you know, I tried to watch it back a few years ago, can't because it it doesn't work for me. Mark is saying, "What's this? Black flag, pints, mm, babs." <laughs> okay, and Lex is saying maybe an older version of Rose Tyler. Ooh, well, that would have good been good, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. That could have been good. She would have been good. I have found this though on my my research, and I love this picture. Look at this. Ah, fantastic! That, Isn't that wonderful? Uh, that's publicising the Carry On stage show from the nineteen seventies, Carry On London. It absolutely is, and they did a lot of publicity for this for Carry On London. Uh, and there's Jack on the on the left hand side there, but there she is with Peter Butterworth. Mm -hmm. um, and I just I just think it's a wonderful picture. You know, fancy seeing them doing Carry On live. I wonder if it worked. <laughs> I don't know if it, it was worked. It was a review show which had various variety acts in it, but the carry, well, the core of the Carry On gang sort of reenacted some classic Carry On scenes on stage in between these acts. Ooh, there you go. Um, before we come up to date a little bit, everybody, we need another joke from Phil. I think it needs so to be um, it? Yeah, Ian, have you, have you given him a number or is it George's turn? George, 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 George. Go on, George, George, give me a number. Oh, let's go inside number nine. Inside number nine. It's an AI gag, George. Well done. <laughs> well done, George. Also, well, that's picked off. <laughs> you can guess what I prompted it with. Why did the TARDIS hesitate to land near the time lash? <laughs> Oh, God. He didn't want to catch bad writing. Harsh. <laughs> Glenn, if you're watching, yeah, I'm really sorry. Fan then, obviously. That, yes. That's chat GPT <laughs> for you, which I shan't be using again. Uh, no. <laughs> yeah, and we will apologise again to Glenn if you're watching, because that's just rotten. Absolutely. I've seen him in a couple of weeks, so that's, that's <laughs> terrible. <laughs> it's um, from here on in. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to Who's Views. Thank you very much for watching. Please like the video. If you haven't already subscribed to the channel, please subscribe to the channel. Thank you very much to everybody that has subscribed. We are chuffed here on Who's Views by the amount of subscriptions we're getting at the moment. So thank you so much for joining us. This is our Easter and April Fool's Day special where we are just appreciating and chatting and reminiscing about the comic geniuses that have managed at some point to turn up in Doctor Who. And we're going to more recent times now, because do you remember the fuss, everybody, when it was announced that this young lady was going to turn up in Doctor Who? Mm. <laughs> now, this was the, Bonnie, uh, the Billy Piper thing all over again, because fandom went into meltdown. And I have to say, I was part of it, just thinking, was what? I. What? Yeah, what? Catherine Tate, of course, is, was a massive star at the time. A huge star with incredibly successful BBC series, which will probably not get, ever get broadcast again. <laughs> because she had such wonderful characters. I'll be bothered. I'll be yes. bothered. I'll probably not. Yeah. Nan, can't be bothered character. I can't remember her name now. The Irish uh, gay boy's mum. You know, it, it was just so funny, the whole thing. And then it was announced that she was coming into Doctor Who for the Christmas episode. And there was a meltdown, wasn't there? Absolutely. I must admit, when she turned up in uh, Romy Bride, I was I hated that episode and I found her really annoying. And I thought, thank God it was one episode. Then she was going to come back 
and I was still disappointed. But then when she came back, I thought she was brilliant. Really enjoyed her. You know, I was just the opposite, Paul. When I watched the Christmas episode, I thought, you know, she really nailed that. And I remember thinking, but she wouldn't work as an ongoing companion because the gag was the wedding dress, you know, <laughs> and all that sort of sparky repartee okay. and the rest of it. Yeah. Uh, but when she did come back, um, I, I still think she's the, her and David Tennant are the best lineup of the revived series. Yeah. Yeah. Well, First their relationships time. around. Yeah. Sorry? First time around. First time, time around, yeah. yeah. Absolutely re- ruined it second time around. Mm-hmm. Their relationship, though, between Tennant and Tate is personal as well, isn't it? Because they're such good friends. I mean, they've done other projects together. As Kirsty was saying there, uh, they did the, the Red Nose sketch. Um, but they've also yeah. done plays together, haven't they? And they've done that, and, and they're obviously really, really good pals. And they came back, as we know, for the 60th anniversary. But I love the way that in the in the Runaway Bride, she was she was doing exactly what I expected her to do. She was quite shouty, wasn't she? All right, you know, no yeah. pockets, pockets. You know, and she was playing a bit of a Lauren there as well that was creeping mm-hmm. into it. But then she shows her ability when she came back she toned it down the writing toned down they understood this had to be a a a different character to get through the 14 episodes and actually i fell in love with donna in that series and catherine's performance of donna because she was really and the comic timing was there paul that bit of mind they do in their partners in crime when she's talking about on the internet i saw you know that kind of stuff that is hilarious it's so well done and then say lancashire catches them having a conversation that's absolutely brilliant really Really funny, yeah. yeah, and that's where they put that's where they played in it because you know, yeah. I think she helped Tennant with his comic ability a bit more, mm. yeah, because he's obviously bouncing I, off it. Um, I heard, and I don't know if there's any truth in this, that David Tennant and Catherine Tate sort of had a bit of a Tom Baker, Louise Jameson relationship initially, and they, they didn't quite hit it off for a while, oh. uh, and things were a bit sparky between them, but improved as time went on. Oh, that's interesting. Catherine, David, if you're watching, come on the show and tell us more about that. We'd love to know. Is that true? There's no chance they'd come on the show. (laughs) (laughs) It's not going to now, because I'm going to say I didn't like her sort of comedy output. So I was a bit nervous when she was going to be in Doctor Who, and then I didn't like her in Doctor Who either. And I think that was the first time I stopped watching Doctor Who. Yeah. It was was her time with um, Tennant. I just found her grating. Sorry. I don't want to be a no, negative no. Nora in what is a positive episode. No, not at all. You've got you've got you've got to tell us what you but, think about it. She yeah, wasn't for everyone. Think. She wasn't she wasn't for everyone. But do you know what? She did help people come to the show because I mm-hmm. had um, I had friends who were not wees and are not wees again now, and all they watched was those episodes with Catherine in. You know, so they did a bit of a Kylie really because the Kylie yeah. fans came for Kylie. And then Tate has her own fans to this very day, of course, and they came to obviously to watch Doctor Who. And that whole season got very healthy ratings, let's face it, mm-hmm. without the overnights and without the addition of the iPlayer. Sure. Um, got real editorial comment. But it got really good. And I think it's because some of the Notwees came along and watched it as well. Kirsty's reminding us that the play that we're talking one of the plays they did was Much Ado About Nothing, which yes. got rave reviews, do you remember, with the two of them yes. there? Uh, Lex is telling us not too bad in the Christmas special, but better in 2008 series. Yeah, I yeah. think so. I, yeah, I can watch so, yeah. it quite happily. I mean, there's there's, there's there's so scenes like the scenes in the in the Ood one where yeah. she she's gutted, isn't she, over this whole thing? And, and who needs a who needs a, a, a whapping over the head with social commentary when you've got yeah. Catherine playing it for you? And the same with the fires of Pompeii as well. Oh, at the end, where she's kind of want the doctor to save people, yeah. you know, and he saves yeah. Capaldi's family, and that that's brilliant. And yeah. she was going to do comedy and serious drama brilliantly. She's really. Well, it, yeah. I personally think it was Doctor Who that also illustrated to casting directors how good she could be as yeah. a serious actor. Because she, currently she's in, a, a, in the West End right now, isn't she, doing a, a play? And, and apparently Neve McIntosh is in that show with her, who plays Madame Vasco. Oh, yeah. I, didn't know, I didn't know that, but there you go. Um, but it, it, that, the, the brilliant thing about Tate is she was able to be comic, throughout certain episodes, certain, certain scenes, back of the head with the Santarans, you know, those little beautiful moments there. Mm-hmm. But she builds it and builds it and builds it to that incredible ending where you feel her loss and you are genuinely, oh, my God, it, ha- it is like a friend's just died. You know, that whole thing. You, you, that's why they ruined it, didn't they, bringing them back? Because yeah. that whole ending was, was the whole of, Donna's story and Catherine Tate's story on the show, and it was it was all done beautifully and tied up beautifully, and that was it. it. 
it's a great, it, it reminds me very much of uh, Jamie and Zoe, you know, it's that kind of same kind mm. of gut wrenching, having their minds wiped, you know, effectively uh, to forget the doctor. That's heartbreaking, isn't it? Yeah, it really, really is. But again, it shows the ability that these people that a lot of, of people would think, oh, they're just comics, they can actually do the versatile, versatile thing of different roles. And I think Catherine Tate is a modern version of that because she was just wonderful. And as Ian was saying, though, <clears throat> a little bit spoiled <laughs> last year, wasn't it? Uh, yeah. Turn left was brilliant, says Dalek, I love you. Yeah. 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 And chef's kiss for that. Kirsty's saying that a lot. That's another new thing with the kids at the moment, isn't it? The chef's kiss yeah. thing. All oh, right, is that what it means? Right. That's what it is. The chef was I'm way too old. Yeah. 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 Way too yeah. old for that. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, we've got that from Mark saying, Kylie, kiss, 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 Kylie. Oh. I just think one of Catherine Tate's characters, Nan, who I love. Nan. Um, if Nan was watching the 60th um, anniversary specials, it would just be, you know, what a load of old shit. <laughs> <laughs> she did a great episode of Deal or No Deal. It was hilarious. Have you seen oh, that? I've seen that. I've seen That's that on the, on the Tube of Who. Really uh, Gar yeah. Garbage yeah. is saying, love Tate before Who. I knew she was a quality actress. Unfortunately, many saw her as the old nan or schoolgirl, Lauren. But she has a huge range and a stage actress as well, I believe. Yeah, and that, that was it. I mean, if anything, Doctor Who... Was she was one of the actresses that got something from those initial few years of Doctor Who, right up to I, I would say um, Karen Gillan, because mm. they, they the, the presence was there, and suddenly people were seeing them in a different light. Uh, a lot of you are talking about Turn Left and how brilliant she is in that. Absolutely, Dalek, I love you. Was saying Catherine was the one was the best of the recent companions uh, until recent episodes, but I blame a certain person for that. Say no more. We know exactly. What you saying there? The language translation sketch still has me laughing, but she'd be cancelled. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Oh, and Doug, Doug is uh, admitting here. I was one of the naysayers when Catherine Tate was cast. I thought she was going to be one note. She showed great range, and her chemistry with Tennant was fantastic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm um, the sorry, Phil, you broke up there. I said I'm in the minority, aren't I? <laughs> yes, I think you probably are. I think you probably are. Oi, watch it, Spaceman. Now, that was from the Christmas Invasion, though, wasn't it? But she did carry on. That was one of the running gags there, wasn't it? But the way she would deliver it would be abs would be different all the time, wouldn't it? It would be quite funny. Uh, I like that. Um, right, what's what, 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 what we've got here? Um, okay, yeah, yeah. So thanks for that. Yes, yeah, so that was there. Thank you for everybody in the chat. You've got a lot coming through in the chat, so thank you for that. Um, so from Catherine Tate. Ah, now, in a similar vein to Catherine Tate, there are two other comedians that were known for their comedy at the time that also both came into Doctor Who. Now, I want to know from you guys, and I want to know from anybody in the chat, was this the same? Was this the, the, the same sort of stroke of genius striking twice or not? I am, of course, talking about Matt Lucas and David Williams. Um, so Matt Lucas sort of, for me, the parallel there being cast as another companion, not Dole, of course, with Peter Capaldi, whereas Williams starred in a, a Matt Smith episode. So thoughts on these two in Doctor Who? I, I love Matt, Matt Lucas generally as a performer. I love Little Britain, thought it was hilarious, but I hated Nardol, and it's a waste of Matt Lucas's talent, I have to say. Mm-hmm. It's my turn to be in the minority, Phil, just in case of that. <laughs> well, I hate to join you, but I wasn't a fan of Nardole either. He was kind right, of okay. neither hither nor thither. I don't... Yeah. I think everything generally would have run perfectly well without him. Um, yeah. If I it was just if it was just a Capaldi and Pearl, that would be fine, you know? Bill, yeah. brother, yeah. So he was a third wheel for me. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Would, you, would you agree with that, Ian? Absolutely, yeah. I, I, I didn't see the point in him. And as with pretty much everything Moffat, it was unless I missed it, which, you know, a lot of it was forgettable. Um, did they ever explain how he came back and how when he waddled in at the start of the first episode of the series, some bolts or something fell out of his sleeve? I don't know. Was he mechanical? Yeah. Christ yeah. knows. Yeah, and, was he a uh, robot? That, I never got yeah. that if he's a robot or not. I never understood that. I have no idea. And equally don't really find myself caring 
to be quite honest. It was just, you know, that was a series of Pearl saying, do you know I'm gay 87 times in a row? And, and that really? Was I never picked up on that. <laughs> yeah. It was very subtle, George. It was really subtle. <laughs> Probably why it went over my head. Yeah, me, me as well. The, the thing about it is, I think, I think what, what um, Moffat and, again, with Chibnall, they thought having a comedian in to... Uh, to deliver a companion performance is going to work every time. I think Cat and Tate was a real fluke because they mm. tried it with uh, Matt Lucas, then with um, Bradley Walsh, and then John Bishop. It didn't work. Oh, at that's all. the point. I'd forgotten they were in it. But, yeah. So. <laughs> no pictures of them, folks. <laughs> forgotten about that. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. Um, Michael is saying what I think here. Nodol is an odd character. Um, yeah, I think I personally think that Moffat was thinking, oh, it worked with Tate. So it's going to work with Lucas, and I don't think it did because mm, the no. character just wasn't there, was it? No. no. Like you said, a waste of Matt Lucas's talent. Really funny guy, great performer, but what a waste, really. Mm. Timescales is also saying to us, wish there had been better character development of Nardole. Mm. And also oh, saying that... Um, I mean, it's the... the he was playing Matt character. Lucas, wasn't he, a little bit, wasn't he? Yeah. Hmm. I don't know. Um... I, I think he's a forgettable companion, though. Mm, yeah. You know, and it's and it's Matt Lucas, and I think he's forgettable. Um, I did not like the Nodol character either. Waste of space and time, says Dalek, I love you. And Doug is telling us Nodol didn't work at all. He didn't contribute much to any story. I feel it might have been stunt casting, plus he is a fan. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. Um, Wally on show, isn't it? Fan. Yeah. Mm. And Garbage is telling us, Matt Lucas is great, but watching him crying last year, apologising about his shows, upsetting people, wasn't needed. Well, that's the thing. These two seem to have jumped on that um, that bandwagon now, haven't they? Because apparently they are in production now, preparing for a new series of Little Britain, which will be a woke version of Little Britain, which is hilarious in itself. Yeah, can't wait for that. Looking forward. Microscopic Britain. <laughs> How? <laughs> <laughs> Very short Britain, I thought. Really. 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be when that's it. Yes. It's going to be assuming a... Tom won't be narrating it. <laughs> well, you know, the AI. But I tell you something, it's going to be a huge hit and really in tune with the British public. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that's not going to happen, is it? Um, but that, there we go. Uh, Time scales is saying this. Um, yeah, and uh, yep. yeah, Michael. I'm sorry, I've forgotten that Mr. Bradley Walsh was even in Doctor Who. So I'm sorry, no pictures of him. Sorry about that. Yeah. Forgotten. Sorry. I thought he had a lot of potential, but again, he was weighted as well. Mm. Though I have to say about Bradley Walsh, he did make a very good villain in an episode of the Sarah Jane Adventures. Yes, he did. That's yeah. true. That's very mm. true. That's a really good one there. He's quite sinister in that, isn't he? Mm -hmm. You know, with, uh, with playing against Liz, it's just quite, it's quite hissing. Mm -hmm. You know, it is wonderful that one. So yeah, uh, did anybody appreciate Bradley Walsh in? As, what was it? What was it? It was the Pied Piper, wasn't he? Yes. Yeah. Pipe Piper in, in reinvented because he can live forever or something. Yeah, we should review that one day. I'll re review, shouldn't we? We should start looking at Sarah Jane. I'll just make a note of that. That's something else for us to do. There we go. Let us know if you want to see that. That could be quite fun. And um, what else we got coming into the chat? Thank you, everybody, as I say, for joining us on this special Easter and April Fool's Day version of the show. Um, yeah, but no, but yeah, but no, but yeah, but no, but no, but that, but just leave it. Yeah. Says that, yeah, and Dalek, I love you. Was saying my computer says no. <laughs> yeah, that that line's really hard. I remember we reviewed the Ace Warriors, and uh, that line's in the Ace Warriors, but it's hard to take seriously. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're interested, Garbage is telling everybody that Bradley Walsh is currently in the reruns of classic Coronation Street, and he's very good in it. That's what made it. That's that gave him the break, wasn't it? Wasn't the Curry when he went into that? Yeah. And people saw was that. It, he was he Mike Baldwin's son in that? I think. Yeah. 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 yeah, 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 and he inherited the factory and everything, didn't he? <laughs> I sound like I know what I'm saying, don't I? I, just, <laughs> I don't think I ever saw them much, but there you go. Um, over the years, though, it's not just uh, comic actors that have gone into Doctor Who. Comic actors have tried to write about Doctor Who. And I'm going to put it to you, Hootastic panel and everybody in the chat. Why are they always crap? I, <laughs> I don't actually really think any of the um, comic sketches that have appeared over the years have actually been any funny uh, and i'm going to include in this one of my all-time favorites the late great utterly brilliant and much missed victoria wood 
Now, for those of you outside the UK who may not have heard of Victoria Wood, she was a giant in the comedy uh, and show business industry. She was a performer. Her tours would always sell out. She eventually stopped touring with her comedy routine and took over Albert Hall for over a week and sold out every single night. The only comic at the time, I don't know if it's been beaten, but certainly the only comic to do that at the Albert Hall. She was a giant. She came along in the 1980s um, with Wooden Walters, with Julie Walters first for, a te- uh, for Granada Television. And then she moved over to the BBC for Victoria Wood has seen on television. And that was the making of her because in the 80s, that was it. She was the first real proper female comic since Joyce Grenville. Um, and she really paved the way for every other female to this very day in that industry, I'm going to say. I'm going to put it out there because she's one of my favourites. That, that, that was it. But Victoria Wood had a go at a Doctor Who sketch. It was bloody awful. Does anyone yeah. remember this? Do yeah, Jim Broadbent as the Doctor. Jim Broadbent, yes. Yeah. 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 I, I first yeah. go as the Doctor, by the way. We'll come to yeah. that in a second. And as you we're, can see... We're winning that... Tom Collin and, so, and, and, and Davison's costume all together, just about, I think. <laughs> Yeah, and the and the umbrella. So yeah. she knew her stuff. Victoria Wood obviously knew her stuff. He, and she also knew that he needed uh, a, a female companion. And this one is, is incredibly thick. This one, uh, you know, for a female writer to write uh, a, a female character like this, the traditional slap down. We never had a companion like this in Doctor Who. It was all that sort of nonsense that went with the look of it. Wobbly walls yeah. and a wobbly villain which I couldn't find any real pictures of, but it's this big green blob called Crayola. Yeah. yeah. I love that, but there's a, re- there's a bit that did make me laugh when I mean, Jim Broadbent says something like, uh, I'm going to cause a diversion, go over there and show, show him your operation scar, or something <laughs> like that, which has got a funny line. But uh, it is a fairly rubbish sketch. I did like the doors, though. The, the farty doors are quite good. They're coming in and out. They're quite funny. I wonder, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm having appreciated Victoria Wood's um, work and also read an awful lot about her before she passed and now since. Why did she bother? She was so much better than this sketch that was crammed into one of those shows. Um, if I remember rightly, wasn't it part of um, a whole sequence where she gagged up classic TV shows? I seem to remember it was back to back with a, a sketch of the early days of Coronation Street. Which what? was much better. Yeah, wasn't she in a Sharples in it or something? If she I was right. in a Sharples in that, and there was Julie Walters yeah. playing Minnie Caldwell. Yeah. And then there was the other lady playing the other part, which I can't remember the, the part, but that was brilliant, that one, because it was down to earth, northern humor. And it's quite easy to take off Coronation Street in that style. But what I'm, what I'm suggesting here, when it comes to Doctor Who, these these people try and do it, and it's not particular fun, particularly funny. Um, so th- there was that one for Victoria Wood, but I'm also going to say that these two failed. Oh, God, yeah, yeah. French and Saunders, 1986-87, using the Trial of a Time Lord set. They played in this, um, and these are the contemporaries of Victoria Wood. They came in just behind her, really, but they were all sort of around at the same time. But French and Saunders wrote this bloody awful sketch about when they were backup artists. Extras, we used to call them. I don't know if we do now, but they were backup. Do any of you remember that one? Because that was just... Yeah, the, it, was never bro- it was never broadcast, was it? Apparently it's never broadcast. It was shown as an extra on one of the... I've the seen DVDs. it on... Um, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. And I think I think it was on one of the DVDs because I've got it somewhere. Yeah. So I think it's on a French yeah. and Saunders DVD, the box set. And I sat down and when this thing started, I was horrified. And we've got another Doctor connection in that. George Layton plays Doctor Who in that. Uh, and he's in the Space Pirates. Yeah, and he was also in Carry On Behind. Yeah, he was. And we just have to mention as well that Jim Broadbent, who was in the Victoria Wood sketch, years later would come back for that blooming awful thing that Moffat wrote called "The Curse of the Fatal Death," which I hate talking about. But if you want to go on, I'll just tune out um, for a minute. But um, I mean, what the you said, JT, on the bottom that, box. Yeah. <laughs> well, you said, JT, that there's never been a successful Doctor Who skit. I'm uh, controversial opinion incoming, but. Can you send up what is essentially a send up? I don't yeah. know, but I think Russell T. Davis is having a good go. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what Mr. Pertwee said, wasn't it? You know, you can't send up a send up. You know. But... Yeah, but is Doctor Who a send up though? I don't know. I you know I've never thought of Doctor Who as a send up and such, but you know, it. I just it it just amazes me that they would even waste their time because the other one I didn't find funny is this one, which is now a little bit famous. Yeah. 
Now, I wonder what inspired the new doctor to dress like Lenny Henry, I wonder. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> or Rupert the Bear, it looks like, to be honest. But, um, well, it was supposed to be a little bit Rupert the Bear-ish. Yeah. But again, this is Lenny Henry's show from the 1980s on the BBC. Mm -hmm. I can't believe that John Nathan Turner signed these things off. Mm. Because this was 1985 for the Lenny Henry one. He and was the normally so careful. Was... Sorry? He was normally so careful with what he gave the OK to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and he does seem to have dropped the ball a few times with, with stuff like this. Whether he thought it would open it up to new audiences or what, I, d I don't know. But I hope maintain a public right. profile by having it feature on another show. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, because yeah, it was um, all about the profile, wasn't he? Yeah. Really? yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, another one I remember, which when I saw it, I just thought was numbingly unfunny, was um, when Paul O'Grady as Lily Savage did oh. a skit as well. Yeah. 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 Um, that was on the Paul O'Grady show again on the BBC with well, the Lily Savage show. Um, mm -hmm. For those of you who do not know, Paul O'Grady sadly passed last year, but he was another one that was he was a comic. But he, he made his name in the gay bars of London as a drag queen called Lily Savage. And he was that drag queen for years and years and years, and eventually got onto television. <laughs> I don't know why or how, but it made Paul. And eventually he said, right, I've had enough of this. I'm taking the tights and the wig off because it was too much for him. And he became Paul O'Grady, chat host and what have you. But his sketch about Doctor Who was bloody awful as well. There's, there's something in common here. They can't get it right, can yeah. they? But well, Gail, Gail, Gail Tuesday was his companion, the, the comedian. She was the, mm -hmm. the kind of, uh, kind of uh, blonde, thick companion in it. The Gail like, Tuesday, that was a character as well, by yeah, the way, for everybody. Yeah, was, uh, don't remember. Gail Tuesday yeah, was a page yeah. three stunner. Yeah, mm -hmm. she was very funny. Yeah. So that what wouldn't really, be allowed. Yeah, what really surprised me about the Paul O'Grady skit, though, was he also did a takeoff of the, the Avengers, where as Lily Savage, he played, well, he played both Emma Peel and Tara King. That's right. And that was really on the money. I mean, I'm a huge fan of the Avengers as well, but that really played homage to it, and it was very funny. Well, so was O'Grady, wasn't he? Yeah. He knew it. Yeah. Like, he went yeah, to he, the. Um, he, he used to go to the Avengers, Avengers conventions. Fan. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. He went to the Avengers conventions and stayed at the weekend with all the Avengers fans and mucked in yes. and bought everyone and, a drink. Uh, he it. was he was a big personal mate of Linda Thorson's as well. He, did. he loved her, didn't he? He loved yeah. her. Uh, in the in the chat, what you're all saying to us, TARDIS travel scene, the sketch was quite close to the twin dilemma. <laughs> mm. um, imagine Victoria Wood as the Doctor is saying, Michael. Well, no. Yeah, yeah. Uh, about the French and Saunders one, it was filmed on the Trial of a Time Lord set, and it's awful. Mm. Yeah. And they're wearing Silurian masks, aren't they, in it as well, which is... Uh, I think they just went good. to the costume. You know, it's... Um, where was this Victoria Wood sketch from? Did it get mentioned? It was from uh, Victoria Wood, the scene on TV, I think. It was mm. one of those, I think. Or it might be one of her specials. She did an awful lot for the BBC, but you can find it. Um, and it's not that brilliant. You can find it on the, the Tube of Who as well. Dalek, I love you saying the Lenny Henry sketch is now more like the real thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um, um, what else we got here? Um, oh, yeah, it's, uh, this about the... Oh, sorry, yeah. It's very awful, not funny. I'm going to say that about all of them. Yeah. Well, one, one that, that isn't very funny is in my, my little tag there, uh, the Planet Chroma Key 5. If you remember, End of Part 1 was a, a comedy sketch yes. show on ITV, mm -hmm. made in about 1979, directed by Jeffrey Sachs, who directed uh, the TV movie. But it's got Fred Harris from Play School in it and Sue Holderness, who plays um, Marlene in... Um, all of and horses playing Romana and the fourth doctor, and it's it's absolutely rubbish. Mm. Can I right? about time travel? Did Gail Tuesday come after Ruby Sunday or <laughs> <laughs> just the following Sunday? Um, and do you remember the the uh, the Cracker Jack skit back in the 1970s? Yes, yes, that again. Um, yeah. Peter Glaze, who had been in Doctor Who in the Sensorite. The Sensorite. Yes. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He was the Brigadier. Yes. In was, Jack, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. Cracker Jack. Yeah. Cracker Jack. That'll, that'll confuse the young ones. What are you going to say, Phil? I'm sorry. Slightly changing the subject. About, and I was on my last family holiday with my, with my dad, so I'm going to say it's pushing 25, 30 years ago, there was a uh, comic in Viz, you know, the uh, yes, Viz, yeah. comic, mm -hmm. uh, called Dr. Pooh. Very yeah. clever. Traveling yes. through time and space, looking for somewhere to have a, 
And <laughs> honestly, I still laugh at it now. Thinking no, that's about funny. It. That is funny. Yeah, because it is genuinely. But it's it's a beautiful kind of homage to Doctor Who. Whoever wrote it obviously loves it, and he lands on this uh, planet and he goes to to drop his bolt in the sea. Uh, but then the sea devils come out and he's like, oh, bloody hell. And he has to put his paper under his arm and run back off to the TARDIS and materialize somewhere else. It's great. And I remember just reading that page over and over on this holiday and, and just <laughs> absolutely howling at it. It's It must be on the interweb somewhere. The video is brilliant. I've got it saved somewhere. Oh, there's a video of it. Oh, yeah. It's fantastic as well. I'll, I'll, I'll dig it out. I'll send it to you. Oh, nice one. I mean, I haven't seen that since... Well, since this cruise around the Mediterranean in like 1990 <laughs> or something. It exists. It exists. Ian, did they make an animation of it then, did they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Could I, I've seen some of them. I know they did Roger Melly, the man on telly, and Peter Cook did the voice, and they did the fat slags right. and things like that, which yeah, were brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah they must have watered this enjoy. down by now, surely. I'm so yeah, amazing, yeah. if that's... Yeah. I'm going to check. Yeah, like, it's firmly rooted in my head, uh, like... Running through time and space <laughs> looking for somewhere to do a big shit. <laughs> Doctor <laughs> Who, that'll be easy to Rock find. A YouTube, clever comedy. Yeah. Yeah. Really yeah. highbrow stuff. Well, yeah, I found it. Yeah, I'll send it. Well, send it. Thank, thank, thanks for everybody yeah. in the chat for all your, on your, your thoughts on those. Um, I just found it, it was interesting that genuine, clever comic writers and performers like, like Victoria Woods, French and Saunders, Lenny Henry couldn't get it right and the, well, the, not the, even not the, even the, the likes of mike and benny winters could get it right i've got this yes. from oh yeah, you have, yeah. Uh, yes and it's called um hello my daleks and mm -hmm. in it i watched it again today i couldn't remember a thing about it when i bought it uh and i watched it again it's really really bad the daleks look like early design that raymond put in the bin and uh it's <laughs> they, even, they even use the theme you know in it and they've, mm -hmm. they've got the police box and everything it's uh and uh benny winters plays the first doctor and for people who don't know benny winters is a bit like a a, a human version of roland rat if you mm -hmm. want to know that but... uh, <laughs> and there was there was another early one where clive dunn played the doctor as well wasn't there yeah mm. yeah but, with michael and, benton yeah 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 i'm i'm working my way through the season 15 box set at the moment and the uh the Doctor Emu, um, oh, the new yeah, on there, oh, and yeah. I remember watching those when they were first broadcast, thinking, yeah. this is abysmal." Yeah, and I watched them the other day, and I just I went, "Yep, these are still abysmal." Yeah, <gasps> yeah. The, I, re the, I remember the those. Yeah, yeah, he, 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 he had dustbins for the Daleks, yeah. and he went. He was in a proper red phone box, wasn't he, for his mm -hmm. Tardis? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and they had the scarf and the hat and everything like that. But I remember not being impressed with it. I must have been six or seven years old when that show was on. And that was another sketch in a in a in a sketch show for children. Mm -hmm. it, it's very interesting, isn't it? How all of them just sort of don't do it properly. Mm -hmm. And there must be a reason for that. Maybe they're yeah. trying too hard. I don't know. Those internal BBC Christmas or blooper tape ones genuinely yeah. are funny. Yeah. Um, and and you know that they're, they're they're nice little thumbnails that you know the things that we were never supposed to see. For me, um, the funniest one is one with Cleese and Per yeah. Um, yeah. Cleese and Tom Baker and the autograph for the blind yes. nephew. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, yeah. brutal, but so mm -hmm. funny. Just, I'll tell him you signed it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll just tell him. I haven't got a pen. Yeah. Just tell him. <laughs> <laughs> yep, and that's very John Cleese as well, isn't it? That whole oh, thing. Man. Good for him. He's still sticking his ground today, I tell you. Yeah. We're going to come to uh, something that Garbage has just said to us in the chat very quickly. But, George, can you choose another number for Phil? Oh, let's have number four. Number four. Why didn't the Dalek apply for a job at the job centre? <laughs> Go on. There he wasn't get any central shift work available. Oh. Thank you. Try that. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> Moving on. Uh, you are watching Who's Views. This is our Easter and April Fool's Day special, as if you haven't guessed. We're going to be, we are looking at the comics that found their way into Doctor Who. We're also and looking Phil. at... And Phil. And <laughs> Phil, yeah. <laughs> telling us some really <laughs> awful jokes. Um, but, yeah... And this is one, uh, if you are of a nervous disposition, you should look away now. Good. Okay. Because Garbage is asking us all, 
Isn't the Spike Milligan sketch funny? <laughs> now, this is where I'm going to eat my words slightly because this is the only sketch that actually is funny. This is a fabulous picture from the National Portrait Gallery of the genius that was Spike Milligan. And if you do not know this sketch, you can guarantee that in this day and age, I wasn't even going to dare putting a picture of this on it because we never know what can happen in this day and age. But you, if you know this sketch, you know this. I, I thought it was hilarious. You know, Could you describe uh, it, JT, for anyone who hasn't seen it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's called. Cool. Well, the, the name of the sketch is called Pakistani Dalek, and you have to remember, of course, that this is 1970s. Yes. Um, and the Dalek comes in wanting to know if his wife, who's a human, has got his dinner ready, and then exterminates the dog and says, put him in the curry. And the budgie, and the granny. Now. Yeah, the budgie, the <laughs> granny. There are... If you haven't seen this, it is available in trimmed form. And I think one of the DVDs, but I can't remember which one it is, but it is trimmed. I think the full thing is on YouTube funny. as well. Yeah. Right, there you go. Um, Johnny the baby Dalek, the little boy Dalek's fantastic as well. Yeah. Yeah, I think if you if we see um, in the 1980s, the Rick Mail and Aid Ed Edmondson bottom, whenever Aid Edmondson is drunk or whatever, and he's staggering around all over the place, that's what this Dalek reminds me of. It just comes into the room and it's all over the place. It's smashing into the furniture. And it's yeah, and I'm not sure Spike Milligan's in the actual Dalek. That's why it's so <laughs> rash. <laughs> well, apparently, apparently, some other people seem to think that he is because he does the voice for it as well, doesn't yeah. he? But it's it's. All I can think of is you're damaging the Dalek prop. Stop it. Um, That's why there's such a I, state for destiny. That's why he did all the damage. Um, <laughs> well, two things on that. I heard that it was John Scott Martin inside the Dalek that, that did that. Ah. And, and apparently the Dalek was on loan during the production of Genesis. Yes, that would be about right. Yeah. 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 Yes, that's right. It's because they filmed it at the same time at the BBC mm -hmm. Theatre. God love it. That's something we'll never see the likes of again. They used to have a theatre. I don't know if this is a, a true story or not. Did, didn't um, um, Spike Milgan have a deal that Terry Nation owed him some money or something? Yes. And he waived the rights to use the yes. Daleks in the sketch. Yes. Is that a myth Terry or Nation, an actual true story? Because Terry Nation famously would never give permission for the Daleks to be used in, uh, as a comedy uh, That's right. joke or as comedy. Yeah. But yeah. he gave dispensation to Spike Milligan to, to cancel a debt. Yeah. 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 Um, so that was that one, but yeah, the Spike Milligan sketch. I that one is quite funny. Mm -hmm. Um, and we, I, I'm, it's just one of these one, things, though, isn't it? It's a product yeah. of its time, isn't it? Though, yeah, yeah. it is. Yeah. It is one, it's one time. truly great thing about um, Spike Milligan is his headstone reads, I told you I was ill. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you know what? I remember him being on <laughs> Wogan or Parkinson or something, and he actually told the nation this that's what he was yeah. having on his tombstone to see yeah. it actually done. Brilliant, you know. Just again, it just shows his comic side and his humor. And I just, did, he I, not, did he not have read out for him um, a, a letter from Prince Charles saying how fantastic he was? Yeah, just like groveling yeah. bastard. bastard. <laughs> 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 Prince Charles, or, or the king as he is now, but as back then he, yeah. was, he found that funny because he was a huge Milligan fan. He had all his yeah. books and everything, didn't he? Have yeah. you ever seen? I think it was on one of the BBC. Um, outtake videos you were talking about Ian and there's a, a great shot of Prince Charles when he was in the RAF and he's he's got his, all his gear on and he does an impersonation of Blue Bottle from the Goons and it's Prince Charles doing it, it's fantastic if you get a chance to see it, it's hilarious <laughs> Oh, it's brilliant isn't it I mean, they grew up with these legends didn't they, they do, and we, we sort of inherited them you know, and I think we were bloody lucky I, I consider myself lucky to be around when I was because we got to see all this proper, good old-fashioned British humour and variety talent and how they could turn their hand to stuff. A absolutely wonderful. Um, but, yes, yeah, so there you, there you have it, everybody. Um, Mark is asking us, before we go on to our next one, on comedians, any thoughts on Douglas Adams, the Pirate Planet and Sharda, and he co-wrote City of Death? Um, what can you say about... What can you say about Dar Douglas Adams? There was, there was a... He was a genius, let's face it. He was a brilliant talent, it's as though he was a comedian trap, though. Do you know what I mean? Because he seemed to be, for me, he seemed to be doing tr a lot. Mm -hmm. You know? Do you know, what I'm, do you know what I'm trying to say? He was trying, he was trying to investigate a lot of sides to what he wanted to write about or talk about. But I mean, he really struck gold with City of Death, though, didn't he? Oh yeah, yeah. 
Mm. You know, if, if nothing else. I mean, there's lots to like in Pirate Planet, to be quite honest. Mm -hmm. If it just goes off the edge of camp, you know, literally, it, it's it's still funny. As a kid, I loved that battle with K9 and the polyphase Avatron. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The third robot, <laughs> polyphase Avatron. Brilliant. Yeah, a, a robot parrot is a great idea, mm -hmm. isn't it? Fantastic. Yeah. And then when K9 came in with a parrot shot yeah. down on the end of his nose, yeah. it was just like a, a cheer out loud moment and everything. Yeah. It was that battle you wanted to see. If you weren't going to see K9 with the Daleks because Terra Nation wouldn't let it, then yeah. it was it was against a, a robot murderous parrot. Yeah. Um, but that was that was Douglas Adams through and through. But there was plenty to enjoy about it. But City of Death, absolute, absolute television gold. Oh, yeah. it's, it, it really is. And so watchable again today, isn't it? But mm -hmm. with the Polyphase Avatron, he knew the kids would want that, didn't he? And that's why he did it. He was so in yeah. tune with his, in the audience, in a sense. And he would throw little things in for us that would make us genuinely laugh out loud back in the day, you know? It, and it was usually through Tom who got it. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know? And, well, and that, that was the brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah, he and Tom were big mates, weren't they? Yeah. 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 So, yeah, we love Douglas Adams, um, Mark. So thank you for the question on that. I hope, I hope we've answered it properly for you. But what can you say about him? He was just incredibly versatile and very clever. I mean, look at Hitchhikers, the one that we all know him for. That yeah. is a really clever writing. Really good. And, if, and so many people have tried to copy him since and not quite done it in my book. Well, there you go. Um, for his time. Yeah. Atom is with us and saying to us, weren't some of the funniest Doctor Who moments those were Pertwee, the old specials, or Blue Peter? Totally. Goldie and K um, Shep and K9 is a classic. Yeah, it's lovely. <laughs> That's, that, that upset many of my generation, that particular one, when Shep was attacking the dog. It was just not right. Um, <laughs> um, where else where I was going? Um, what's, what's that mean? I don't know. The blowtorch Dalek got a job, no problem. They're having their own private conversation in there, I think. Obviously, that's fine. Absolutely fine. And Dalek, I love you, was saying the best comedy sketch was the Rowan Atkinson one with a fair few famous faces, including Joanna Lumley as the first female doctor. No, I'm going to disagree with you, Dalek, I love you. I hated it. I was embarrassed. The cheeks of my bum were drawing together with embarrassment. I was just like, what is there was, this? There, was, there was one bit in there when they did that. I'll explain later gag. I quite like that. That was quite funny. But... It was, I didn't it was... mind Jonathan Price as the master. I thought he, he made up very like a, a halfway house between Delgado and Ainley. I thought it looked all right, but um, that was the only bit really for me. Yeah, um, and wasn't it wasn't it broadcasting several episodes through that whole night? I think so. Yeah, yeah but four, four episodes, part. five episodes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> move on. Move on. <laughs> uh, Curse of the Fatal Death is well known in America. Whatever for. And uh, Doug Sims is saying the Pakistani Starlet sketch is genius. I wouldn't, it wouldn't fly today. No, there's no way. There's no way it would fly today at all. Uh, Futurama had some funny Doctor Who jokes and certainly Robot Chicken, did it? And The Simpsons as well. I, I am aware of The Simpsons, yeah. um, but I, I'm not really aware of anything else. Yeah, Tom's but, made a few appearances in The Simpsons, hasn't he? I hope yeah. he got paid. I bet he didn't. <laughs> probably, yeah, I, 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 probably more the image, isn't it? Tom's iconic yeah. image, really, yes. into that one. Um, I'm not reading this one out. <laughs> yeah, that was true. And uh, again, that wouldn't uh, be allowed today. Yes, and John Pertwee's in a notorious um, <laughs> video just a couple yeah, of years yeah. back. <laughs> yeah, Do, and, and when that was brought up again, um, the outroar, the outrage from certain people and I, I watched it and when he says that line at the very end it's I thought it was quite funny because it was it was meant for those sort of people oh, that's the generation mm -hmm. I come from I laughed well at I, I thought it was a bit cringy but I didn't think it was worth an overreaction to it though you know but it wasn't supposed to be seen was it it was a, it was a video yeah, made yeah. for a, a business for a training thing as they all used yeah. to do back in those days so yeah. it, it would have been scripted then wouldn't it sorry it would have been scripted then wouldn't it so yeah totally Totally, just, and, and scripted script. towards the salesmen mm. of yeah. that company because that's mm. when it was done. It was, and they would have been men. Let's face it. But the, 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 because of this, there was a, some kind of campaign to cancel Pertwee at one point. It was ridiculous. It was, it was oh well, that went well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Again, we wouldn't let it happen, would we? No, <laughs> really? a, what bizarre thing to want to do? The poor man's been dead for years, but we want to cancel him for it. Stupid, know, really good. 
yeah. bless him. Uh, anyway, so we'll, we'll move on to that. Now, Dalek, I love you. I want to come on to your um, particular point now because there is no way. You've not mentioned Ken Dodd, or did I miss it somehow? There is no way that you've missed it, and there is absolutely no way that we would forget the one and the only, the fabulous Mr. Ken Dodd. Um, this is a picture from way back in the day, but this just sums up his entire hugely successful career. Um, oh, man. I mean, you know, I can't I can't tell you how, how important Ken Dodd was actually for me growing up with my Liverpool connections because everybody from Liverpool was a major star in my eyes because <laughs> they were always on the telly or singing or something. Cause you had Ken and you had Scylla and you had the Beatles and you know, Neris Hughes was playing a Liverpoolian and you had all these little things. Neris Hughes, of course, and Kinder from Dr. Who. And there were so uh, many, you know, uh, but um, he was the giant uh, joke, wasn't he? There, were, there was an actor, some, uh, somebody Baker from Liverpool as well. Elizabeth Sladen, Paul McGat, we could go up. And also, of course, Chris Chibnall, but he's more formby, so we won't talk about him. But, I mean, there was an awful lot of entertainers here, and Doddy was around for so long, and he toured literally near enough the day he dropped. He was a proper entertainer. And again, this fella filled out theatres in his entire career. Summer seasons, especially back in the day. Blackpool, uh, you know, I cannot remember a time when I didn't go to the Doctor Who exhibition in Blackpool and Doddy wasn't there at the end of the pier holding court, you know, and sold out tickets. And the one and only time I saw Doddy live, we were there for about a week. Yeah. yeah. I was literally peeing myself. I was I, I absolutely saw, peeing myself. I saw him live as well. And, he, and he's like a, a it was like a machine gun telling jokes. It was so fast. <laughs> and you'd have that there's the delayed reaction to, to getting the gags, but you got them, but you never stopped laughing the entire time for like five hours. It was incredible, no. you know. We, That's such a pro. we went to Leicester, uh, I think, because of traffic, we turned up like half an hour, an hour late. We stayed for sort of three and a half, four hours, and in the end, we left before he finished. <laughs> <laughs> we just kept going, and I think yeah. the theatre kicked him out in the end because they needed yeah. to shift. <laughs> <laughs> there was a gag that used to say what the uh, he said to the stage manager just throw the keys on the back and and, and the wings and I'll lock up myself kind of thing. Yeah, and one of his gags on stage, and he certainly said it the night that we went to see him. Um, oh, Paul keeps breaking in now. Um, I'll just bring Paul back into the show. Uh, yeah, there was one of the gags that um, he said when I saw him was. <laughs> Um, something along the lines of, I don't know why you're all laughing because I'm the only one who knows when this is going to finish. <laughs> 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 and he used to do sing songs and cabarets, didn't he? Absolute superb. But I, I remember him for this being a child of the jam butty minds myself. This was yeah. so special when I was a kid. The Diddy Man, look at them I all. Can hear, I can hear we are the Diddy Men playing we right now. Yeah. 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 You can't sing it, you're not allowed. No, 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 no. But uh, yeah, for those of you who don't know uh, Ken Dodd out of the UK, he was a huge, huge star in the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, and into the zero. It was a huge, huge star, a proper, proper entertainer, a proper comic, a proper cabaret. Did towards the middle of his career start to break in or try to break into acting. He was, he was very well known. He did Shakespeare and loved Shakespeare. He did get into Doctor Who via that as well, didn't he? He did a couple of other things, but he was always the comic, constantly touring. Music star, he had a number one hit here in the UK. He actually had a, a beautiful singing voice, yeah, 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 and he was known for it as well. But, but he was from Liverpool, of course, he could sing because they all can. Because mm -hmm. at one said. time, his records outsold the Beatles, yes. And there was a big joke between the Beatles and him, wasn't he, when he met up mm -hmm. with them, of course. <laughs> and Lennon apparently was saying, You robbed us. <laughs> <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. But he was known for all this. Um, and he was also known, of course, for his tickling sticks. That was his trademark. And I was so disappointed that they didn't appear in Delta and the Bannermen because I was expecting them to get whipped out at some point, even just for that little <laughs> breaking the fourth wall nod to the audience bit. But of course, he was in. Delta and the Bannermen, another one that John Nathan Turner was absolutely delighted to get into the roll call of comics that appeared in Doctor Who. Um, I, I love him in this. He's superb in this. He really is. But do you, yeah. again, do you remember the reaction, guys, when it was announced yeah. that, I mean, what was that like? I mean, another meltdown of Doctor Who fandom. Do you remember? 
I, I remember the, the fans went mad, but I, I loved him in this. I, I thought it was hilarious. There's a bit on, I think, is it not the first this? It's like a behind the scenes kids program. Yes. Yeah. And you saw the show alternate takes of him doing some of his bits, and they're funnier than the ones that go in the program, which is a real shame because he's had living all the way through, and it's hilarious, <laughs> absolutely brilliant. I think in the 1980s, though, it was outrage by post, wasn't it? Because you couldn't yeah. just hit the keyboard <laughs> like uh, a, a sad yeah. little warrior. This time it was like, dear sir, I am outraged. Yeah. Send it off. Thank you. Oh, Later, you know. <laughs> yeah. um, Lex is in the chat with us as well, and Lex actually emailed me about Doddy because Lex wanted to, um, everybody to know that when he was a, when he was younger, he stayed about ten to fifteen minutes away from where Doddy lived in Notty Ash in Liverpool. Wow. wow! Yeah, so that's a really good fact. And he also um, said to me, and being some, I sort of knew this. George will know this as well, mm -hmm. but um, Notty Ash is named after the ash trees. Now, are they still there? Are they still down in Notty Ash, the ash trees, or have they built over them or knocked them down for some bizarre reason? Um, if they have gone, it's been in the very recent past. Right. Um, I mean, I've not been over Natty, uh, Notty Ash Way for a good couple of years at least, but they, they were there the last time I was there, or mm. certainly some of them. I don't know how many there were originally. Well, that's good to know. Uh, Doug is telling us here, for some reason, Ken Dodd scared me as a kid. It was probably the goofy look, the mad scientist yeah. professor look with the hair and the teeth. Probably. When he gets killed, spoilers come up in Dilt on the Banner Man. When he gets <laughs> no, killed, yeah, spoilers and then oh, you tell I know, I get now. confused. Yeah, but I must have seen it. So it's, it's been a long time. But anyway, it's, so, um, it's, it's uh, when he gets killed, it's quite dramatic. When, it, when he comes yeah. in, he gets shot and then slides down the wall at the, at the toll gate. It's yeah. incredible. Yeah. Yeah. And then look who's shooting him. Yeah. yeah, one of Go our ahead. hard heavies. who was also yeah. a bit of a, he had a bit of a comic side as well. He, he tried to do it the other way, didn't he? He was known for his dramatic side, Don, and then tried to do comedy as well. But nice, nicely played actually, because the the uproar was, in case you don't know, Ken Dodd was cast as we know as in Delta and the Bannermen, and um, a lot of people went, oh, just as they'd done a few months earlier when it was announced Bonnie Langford was coming into Doctor Who a couple of years before. Um, <clears throat> anyway. So, yeah, so there was this horror, and then it then he appears in the show. The outfit doesn't help, but it is the Tollmaster, wasn't it, well, you know, that we're looking at here. So it sort of fits the character, and if it had been anybody else, that wouldn't have got looked at. But I'll tell you, the person that really, really was pleased about this, apart from John, was, of course, Sylve. Yeah. <laughs> and you know the two of them just had a wonderful time. And it's a wonderful story that Sylve says to this very day when he's talking about Doddy, isn't it? That Dodd turned up with his usual box of tricks and all his props and somebody had to say to him, you don't need any of that. Yeah. <laughs> but how lovely to turn up prepared for whatever they want you to do. That's a pro. Good old fashioned pro there. When he, when he, when he comes out, when they're the, the one millionth customer and he's got his tutor and everything, he comes out, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. That was from his case. Yeah. That was yeah. one of the things from his case. That was one of his own props. <laughs> you know, those sort of things. <laughs> but I mean, you know, we're going to be looking at Delta and the Bannerman in a few weeks' time as part of this series as well. I'm reviewing that, and we'll talk more about Doddy, the legend that was Doddy there. But what what are you guys saying about Dodd in the chat? Let's have a look. Uh, oh, look. Garbage is saying, Ken Dodd, absolutely loved by our King Charles. Very, probably. Mm. And Dalek, I love you, is also in Liverpool. Ken Dodd was a regular customer at TJ Hughes in Liverpool. God bless it. They've moved it and ruined it since. Um, at Christmas times, I served him once or twice a really nice gent. It's brilliant that he stayed in the area as well, isn't it, to the day he died in the house he was born in. I mm. love that. I always love that about Dodd because everybody else moved, Silla. <laughs> um, you know. <laughs> I, I, I loved his stories he used to tell after he got... Um... Uh, in trouble with the tax man, and you sued all these gags about the tax. It's hilarious. I've loved all yeah. that. Yeah. I'm, you know, I, I, we all know I'm not very good at maths. Or <laughs> yes. well, yes. the other one he used to say was when income tax was first introduced, it was two pence in the pound. Nobody told I me. I thought it, it still was. <laughs> <laughs> and, I like it, the um, Ken Dodd had got two new Diddy men. Did he pay his tax and did he chuff? <laughs> <laughs> if you are outside the uk and want to know a little bit more of on the tube of who you can actually look up an audience with ken dodd and another audience with ken dodd they are hilarious go and look at a genius comic at work and how he has this alleged celebrity actually they were all celebrities in those days yeah. audience gripped and apparently they were all there for three hours as well until lwt the company 
well, I say company, told him, no, we've got to cut this now. You know, go and have a look. An audience with Ken Dodd and another audience with Ken Dodd, if, you've, if you're not aware of him and you're known for Doctor Who, because he was just... He was just we, met, we mentioned Kenneth Williams earlier as well. His audience is, is really good. Oh, yes, and, he did and, the Peter did and the Peter Yusinov ones are credible as well. Yeah. Oh, I met him once. Anyway, that's another story. <laughs> he was a, one of our dinosaurs was missing, with, of course, with um, yeah. Joan. Back to Joan on that one. Lovely man. Really lovely man. He signed my books over there. Um, anyway, Lex is saying... <laughs> Ken Dodd has a Time Lord-like character. He would have been an amazing and fantastic Doctor Who. I reckon he would have been a bit Tom Baker-ish because um, mm -hmm. there's certain traits that Tom and Ken had, I think. So I think he would have been like that. Um, but interesting casting that would have been, wouldn't it? You know? It no? would have been interesting. If J&T continued, I wonder if that would have been a choice at some point. Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> you never Probably know. not. <laughs> Probably not. Um, it's more it happened now, though, is it? To be fair, but <laughs> no. you, But you don't get Doddy's caliber now, you know. No, no you and, don't. and had he lived, he he probably would be struggling now, to be honest, mm. because a lot of his jokes were. Here's one of here's one of Doddy's jokes that I, always makes me laugh. Why do why do blon blondes? Sorry again. Why do blondes like BMWs? Because they can spell it. <laughs> <laughs> I always love that one. <laughs> Lex is saying, my nan told me once when Liverpool uh, Phil... Oh, what, I don't know. What's he saying? When Liverpool Phil, he said, I hope you, you brought sandwiches and tea. It's going uh, to be a long time. Yeah. yeah, okay. Ken used to do regular shows at Liverpool Philharmonic Hall. That'd be it. Yeah, yeah. And, and that I can believe, because he used to get a kick out. Of just. But do you know what? You didn't notice you were in there for about 400 years, because he was just so blooming funny. He you know? gave you value yeah. for money, definitely. Without a yeah. Doubt. Ken Dodd and his brother in arms, Sylvester McCoy. I think at this point, we do need to actually mention also Sylvester, yeah. another one of our doctors that comes from a comic background. Um, again, as kids, we knew him for things like Jigsaw, where he played the Omen, and Vision On, didn't we? You know, and, and Tiz Wars as well. Tiz Wars, custard buys, yeah. shoving Ferris. nails up his nose. Ferret down his trap. Up or down, it was always funny, wasn't it? I really don't like to think about that one at all. But <laughs> how did he do that? I must ask him next time I see him. How the hell did you do that? Because it really is. Did he not have a fake, a fake a fake pocket to put the ferret down? Did he not have a like a little area it was meant to go in? Um, probably, probably. Yeah. It's probably a magic circle thing. I've just broken the rule there or something. Like that. <laughs> Are they still going? <laughs> uh, another duo that appeared in 1980s Doctor Who were these two. This is Hale and Pace, who were massive stars in the in the late eighties, mid to late eighties, weren't they? Where are they today? I wonder. But they were, and of course, they appeared as the shopkeepers in the last Doctor Who um, survival, and again surprised everybody because again there was some some of the fandom. This is a tradition now with all of us, isn't it? Some of the casting we got, we're still doing it today. Some of the casting we go, oh, no. and we still we do like, it today. We like a good moon, don't we? <laughs> Yeah, it's traditional and we have to do it because it's in the contract when you sign up to be a Doctor Who fan that you yeah. must moan at all casting. But they surprised everybody again because there was two straight characters there, weren't they? The, the shopkeepers were not funny at all. And it was more or less a sort of nice little cameo, wasn't it? Because they weren't there for that long. But Hale and Pace appeared in, in, in Doctor Who too. But again, huge comic stars at the time. And another one for JNT to go, add that to my collection. <laughs> I mean, Jim T was trying to create publicity opportunities, wasn't he? And that was the thing he was trying he to sell. He had to, though. Yeah. At that yeah. point in the show's history, he had to. And these, what we now call, well, we can allege now, we've got stunt casting. But he had to at this point, didn't he? Because everything helped. And it did get yeah. publicity, just possibly not as much as he wanted and certainly not in the right areas, arguably. I but hey, the face, yeah. With that, you would probably, about two or three years before, obviously, but and we, we touched on it, didn't we, with uh, the Davros thing. But of course, you had Alexi Sale as well, who was huge at the time. Yeah, yeah. again from the eighties run of comedians, the alternative comedians they were called, weren't they? It's really, it's really interesting, isn't it? Because some of those alternative comedians of the eighties that were breaking all the rules and then pushed people like Kenneth Williams and Tarby and all that out to an extent, you know, um, are now quite weird. Some of them, aren't they? They don't seem to. They seem to have lost that rebel edge and seem to be compliant now, and just seem to be yeah. going with the whole. Got Broke very establishment, or or you can you can see them attaching themselves to Palestine or BLM or stuff like that. You know when 
whereas they've they've lost their shine, they've lost their edge. Yeah, they've been replaced just like they replaced people, and now they're struggling a lot of the time to remain relevant. I think. Although, actually, interestingly, allegedly, um, in the last couple of months, it's been announced that Dawn French is working on a new comedy that will be anti woke. Where are you going to broadcast that, Dawn? Yeah. <laughs> will they take it with you? Good luck if you're doing it, Lazy. And I hope you do. And I hope it's wonderful. I'm sure it's going to be. But it's going to be interesting to see who, who broadcasts it, even though it's Dawn French. Good luck Didn't to you. Did she them. bring back Vicar of Dibley and do a kneeling at a sign for Black Lives Matter not so long ago? Then? For Comic Relief or something, yeah, yeah. Which was rather bizarre, wasn't it? Yeah. A little sketch. I don't I know. They, they have still done it a little bit in New Who, haven't they? Had Lee Evans turned up and uh, Frank Skinner. So they've had a few comedians, haven't they? Since yeah, and we haven't got time to talk about them all, have we? Because there, no. as I said at the beginning of the show, there's loads of them when you start delving into it. Uh, Trev and Simon were ten times funnier than Hale and Pace, as were the Chuckle Brothers. I am surprised <laughs> that the Chuckle Brothers never turned up in Doctor Who. To be quite honest, um, <laughs> I'm surprised they weren't playing Hale and Pace's parts. To be honest. Yeah. But there's quite a lot. I think it's about, there were originally about six Chuckle Brothers, I think. Quite a lot of them, I think. Yeah. And Dalek, I love you as ten as I thought Sylvester was dreadful at first, but like most, he grew on me after he calmed his comedic side down and went darker. Yeah. Kirsty is saying that the Vicar of Dibley, Dibley sketch annoyed her because it was her comfort show as a kid. That really makes me feel old. Because <laughs> it was brilliant. Do you remember that Christmas Day episode with Dove with the Sprouts? Oof. Yeah. How we laughed. Well, even even they go was at the wedding. Um, um, uh, the, our friend was dressed as uh, David Tennant, and two Daleks were like bridesmaids. Remember that as well? Yeah, 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 exactly. Just to answer Atom here as well, he's asking us when will we be doing a full tackle of the Doctor Who trailers? When is that scheduled? I want to definitely be there. I have a lot to say. It's tomorrow, half past seven for headlines. So if you're interested in that and Disney Who, then come back tomorrow, half past seven. There you go, Atom. Ha ha ha! How was that for you? Um, yeah, so yeah, this is the one where we're talking about some of the comics that made their way into Doc 2. Thank you for joining us tonight. There are a hell of a lot of comics. Uh, I just want to make a quick, before we go on to our final, final big one that I've kept for last for a particular reason, I want to mention Michael Robbins. Oh. Uh, Michael Robbins, of course, was another 1970s television staple and well-known standout performance in On the Buses. Um, that's another one. You, mm. <laughs> I actually saw it uh, last year, I think it was, guys, on one of the repeat channels, and I struggled with it. On the buses, yeah. On the buses. Yeah. It's mm. so yeah. bloody slow. And although it's a comedy, I couldn't really see it. I thought it was trying to be a drama. I wasn't quite I, sure, you know. What I thought was interesting, though, um, comparing On the Buses to his Doctor Who appearance, I think he's brilliant in The Visitation. He's superb. But I remember reading somewhere that he thought Dot 2 was the most embarrassing thing he's ever done. He did. Obviously, not, not taking into consideration all the buses, which is weird. But... Well, yeah. George, did you hear about this? <laughs> Apparently, Michael Robbins said years later, he, he said, oh, yeah, that was embarrassing. I think it's because he didn't understand it. Uh, I heard something about that. I now always remember Michael Robbins from one of the Pink Panther movies in the 1970s, mm. yeah. where by day he was this very reserved butler in a stately home, and by night he was a drag queen in a club. Yeah. <gasps> Um, yeah, that, that was brilliant casting fashion. for him. That was so unlikely. Brilliant. Yes. <laughs> I wish I'd found a picture of that. <laughs> <laughs> there's a great, there's a great, but I think so. I think he's dead, and he, and he, someone pulls his wig off, and he's got the bald head, and he's got the dress mm -hmm. on, and the makeup is brilliant. It's mm -hmm. a great image. Yeah, yeah. Well, we are going to come back to Michael Robbins as well because we are going to be reviewing the visitation as well in the next few weeks uh, throughout April as part of this this season, if you like. Uh, for playing for laughs. Um, before we get to one of our last ones, Phil, we need another joke from you. So go on, Paul. Um, oh, no, who did it last time? Who, who chose the number? I did it last time, so... All right, Paul, you choose another number now, and we'll have a, we'll have a joke. All right, can I have the, the one, I can't see the number, can I have the one that's just uh, the pink one on the end there, other end? Number 10. Yeah, that number one. 10. Yeah. Number 10, go number 10, yeah. Go number 10. Number 10. This is good. Oh, this one's... What you say. On the Beano as well. Oh, this has got to be good then. What do you call a time traveling cow? I don't know. What do you I call a time traveling cow? cow? Doctor Moo. <laughs> now, that, that, is is very Beano. Beano. that is very Beano. That is very Beano. Ian, I want you to choose another one from Phil, please. 
I would have answered Jodie Whittaker to that. Uh, number eight, please. <laughs> number eight. Controversial. <laughs> what does Doctor Who eat with his pizza? Is this another one from the Beano? This is from Reddit. Oh. 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 What does Doctor Who eat with his pizza? Oh. Dalek oh. bread. Dalek bread. <laughs> You've been on Reddit, Ian. <laughs> oh, you. Dalek bread is the future. <laughs> can, we, can we try next time? Do the postline. We can guess what the joke is. And, do yeah. That yeah. Right. and George, you, you, you choose another number, George. Okay, so. number one, then. Number one. Who travels in a multicolour TARDIS? Ooh, it's got you in it. Who travels in TARDIS? Don't know. It's Dr. Hugh. Oh. Hugh. I liked that one. That tickled me, that did. Dr. Hugh. And we are not surprised, are we, yeah. Who viewers? No. <laughs> All right, we've got two left for the end of the show. Um, like this just saying to us about Michael Robbins, he was he was fantastic. Was this the Great Fire of London and Black play with the sci-fi vibe? I actually really like Michael Robbins' performance in, in The Visitation. Yeah. So it was yeah. actually heartbreaking to hear that he didn't enjoy being in it. But as I say, we're going to come to that. Um, <laughs> we are going to come to that. Um, and Atom is giving you a little email <laughs> there, Phil. There you go. I have left this one to last for a very big reason there are lots of people that we haven't managed to put into the show today because we only have a limited time but this is a legend that we have to pay tribute to as well oh what can we say about the late the great and the much missed bernard cribbins no um as we were saying in our doctor who uh dalek series for dalek invasion of the earth just a couple of nights ago this man Oh, gosh, what can we say? I mean, not only did we grow up with him, but thanks to Doctor Who, Kirsty's generation grew up with him as well, and he was introduced to a whole new set, and then through that, another generation. So that is a huge achievement. But wow, what a career this man had. Um, and his comic timing was always superb, wasn't it? It was. Just, I mean, we showed that in Dalek Invasion of the Earth the other night, didn't we? How, we, how just brilliant he was in that, just being able to perf do that straight performance, but just those little elements there, were delivering the lines made you chuckle. I mean, gosh, this guy. I, I was always very impressed with the fact that he was always very proud of his Doctor Who work. I remember he was doing, uh, he was going to do Stolen Earth, uh, in the new series, and he said to Russell and Phil, I've met the Daleks before, you know, and they said, yes, we know. <laughs> a, great, a great story. Yeah. Yeah. And wasn't that whole thing when he splats the Dalek eye stalk a tribute yeah. to his performance in the in the film? Wasn't that something to do yeah. with that? Yeah, yeah. Totally, yeah. I was lucky enough to meet him in 1992, so before the series came back. Wow. And he said to me then, the two things he's always asked about are the carry-ons and the Dalek movie. He said that they're the two things that have never gone away from him. Yeah. Yeah, because if you don't know, he was in some of the Carry On films. Mm -hmm. um, and always very good when he did them. Uh, with Barbara Windsor and Carry On Spying, one of my favourite Carry On films. Yeah. Mm -hmm. just absolutely, And then when he played Jack, another mm -hmm. Jack. <laughs> I mean, that was, that was quite funny as well. I mean, just... Mm -hmm. We're never going to get the likes of these people again, are we? Yeah. He had one of, his comedy, one of his comedy series. He, he'd do sketches and stuff. And there was one sketch where he was a copper talking about, I don't know if it was like King Kong or something like that. And he was talking to uh, his local police station on a phone from a police box. So he's which, was, which is the same police box that was used in the Dalek movies. Ah! There you go. There, there you we go. go. There's there we the go. Knows. <laughs> I love that little turn there. Isn't that wonderful? That you got, um, I know this is one of your favourites, Paul, as well, but we do have to mention that he did have a very tenuous link. And it, somebody's mentioned it in the chat here as well. But he performed with John Cleese, who was also in Doctor Who, of course, and that lovely sketch yeah. with Alan O'Brien in City of Death. But this has to be one of the most famous roles that Bernard Cribbins performed because this was watched by 21 million people wow. in the UK. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. And this was the inspector. <laughs> I mean, what a role was this? 
he's really, it's funny that I, I, he's brilliant in this, but he's so irritating. It's, it's a great performance. He just really gets on your nerves. He's so fastidious and irritating in a bit of detail. It's a really funny performance. But it is, again, it shows his, his ability to be able to take that character and do something yeah. with it, you know? Yeah. But, I mean, a good example of Bernard Cribbins' versatility, the, the Hitchcock film Frenzy, where he played the pub landlord, mm. uh, and he was such an unlikable character. And you do sit and watch and think, oh, my God, that's Bernard Cribbins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love that when you see these sort of people and you just go, oh, when they do something t totally different for you, it's like the late great Diana Dawes. I'm going off on a tangent now, but she did some fantastic stuff from the glamour puss to the ruffian, you know, and queenie and all that. Anyway, she never got into Doctor Who, sadly, oh, although uh, I reckon uh, Nathan Turner would have liked her in it. Uh, not quite. Uh, it was revealed in the, uh, the season 15 box set that she yeah. was on set of Underworld. Yeah. Oh, of course, because of her husband. Alan Lake, yeah. But she yeah. actually saw part of Underworld being recorded. Why wow. didn't somebody push her in front of the camera yeah. then? <laughs> <laughs> I love Diana Dawes. If you don't know who Diana Dawes is, Google her. She was I have to say, Alan Lake is really good in Underworld. He's one of the best things about it, which doesn't mm. say much for Underworld, but it's a good performance. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Lex is saying about Cribbins here as well. <clears throat> Amazing storyteller and actor. And that, that again, we have to mention this because, of course, um, we, we've talked about his role in Jack and Nori before, but Jack and Nori, he was one of the mainstays and the go-tos in Jack and Nori um, for, for, the, for the whole run, really, I think. Him and Kenneth Williams were the two main favourites, weren't they, George? Uh, yeah, I think Bernard Cribbins just pips Kenneth Williams to the post and uh, Bernard Cribbins did more Jack and Nori's than anybody else. Yeah, I think he did I something think like right. one or two more than Kenneth Williams. Yeah. yeah. He also and, had um, old Jack's boat with Freema Adjuman which was filmed mm -hmm. in Staithes, just up the North Yorkshire coast. If you go up from Whitby and Robin Hood's Bay, you eventually get to Staithes. Gorgeous, gorgeous fishing port yeah. and uh, a much-loved kids' series there. And that's the brilliant thing about it. That was the next generation that he was introduced to, wasn't it, really? Um, and I believe that they, they, they are still available on somewhere or you can still watch that. So there are more kids coming into it. And this yeah. is the great thing about what they've done here, whether it be Dalek Invasion of the Earth or his Doctor Who episodes or that show you've just mentioned there, or this, one of my personal favourites. Oh. Yeah, yeah. He is beautiful in this film i love his character in this he is just magical this is the railway children no other sub i, I will not accept anything else it's this yeah. the lionel jeffries version for me yeah. nothing else counts it's this one only it's just wonderful and he is brilliant in it even the dog loves him there look yeah it's a great great film lionel yeah. jeffries is a great director also a fa fabulous actor and one of my mm. favorite movies is first men in the moon Great film, mm -hmm. fantastic. Great Harry yeah. Housman yeah. film, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It, it, again, I mean Bernard Cribbins, all that comic energy, the ability to change his his, his performance, fitted into Doctor Who beautifully as Wilf, um, and wasn't it wonderful to see him in that cameo? And because it was Cribbins, it just morphed into something bigger, and he was brilliant yeah. in it. Can you imagine? Can you imagine anyone else playing? Donna's grandfather. No. Yeah, it was it was a, a sad uh, reason from becoming the other character after the other actor passed yeah. away, sadly, but it was lovely to have him and, and they managed to retrofit him in with the other character who played in the uh, Voyage of the Dam, didn't they? So that was a lovely connection. It was really well done. Yeah. Michael's remembering Brown Cow from Carry On Spying. <laughs> if you don't know what that's about, you've got to go and watch it. It's hilarious. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's been yeah. Out to yeah. Sorry, Ian? We've got a shout out for the Wombles, and he was quite a singer as well. He had a few tracks yes. out, didn't he? I remember. Right, said Fred, yeah. Fred. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Calypso. And not I the remember. one you're thinking of, yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and again, they all got into the top 10. Mm -hmm. The 70s was a very strange time in Britain. It really was. <laughs> <laughs> well, novelty records did really well. Benny Hill's early went to number one, didn't it? So, oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I love Rick Ribbons' uh, Hornby adverts. Oh, the Hornby adverts. Yeah. 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 Which you can get again. Brilliant. Yeah. yeah. Brilliant. He was just so good, wasn't he, really? And just mm. what he brought to Doctor Who as well was that familiarity, you know, yeah. um, and that warmth. It just shone through, you know, his, his ability to be able to just capture an audience through a, through the lens, whether it be on the big screen or whatever, just on all that experience that he was bringing to it as well. 
I mean, Doctor Who was never quite the same, but he fitted it, didn't he, really? And it was yeah, one of those sure. castings where no one complained about this. Yeah. Unique. Unique in Doctor Who. We all yeah. went, yeah, rather than what? See that, that <laughs> picture you had of him from Jack and Ori? Can you put it up again just for a minute? Yes, I can. If you look what he's wearing, we talked about it, it was almost cast as Doctor Who when we went up for uh, when Pert we left. He looks like he's wearing his, his potential Doctor Who costume. That's a velvet jacket he's got on and everything. Look at that. Mm. The picture we're showing is when he took part in, a, in, in the reading of The Hobbit, which I recall they had several presenters doing the different... It was a sort of different Jack mm. They had several presenters doing different parts of the book because it was so blooming long, and they only had four or five nights to tell it. <laughs> so very interesting. That was the beauty of Jack and Ori. But I always remember when it was either him or Williams on the Monday that would appear with the book. Oh, yes, mm. this is going to be good, you know. Absolutely fabulous. Do you remember him reading things like um, The Winds and the Willows and stuff like that and in the, in the straw boater in his traditional yeah. blazer? Oh, and it suited him that. Oh, that could have been another costume for him had he made it as Doctor Who, which he didn't. But there you are. Um, Doug is saying to us, I love that Bernard Cribbins was rediscovered via Doctor Who. He was brilliant in Faulty Towers. Right, said Fred, instantly takes me back to my childhood. Absolutely. Um, Dalek, I love you, was saying Bernard Cribbins was the father and grandfa grandfather figure most children would look up to. An amazing role. F yeah, he was a role figure, yeah. And Kirsty says, Wilf makes me miss my granddad. Oh, oh, that's nice, though, isn't it? That's really nice. Um, what else? Yeah, okay, that's that. Thank you for that, everybody. Um, yeah, so it, I thought it was nice that we kept Bernard till last um show business legend show business giant and what a benefit and it was such a shame that we didn't get the full performance he might have actually improved those bloody things we got last christmas i don't know <laughs> sorry that's an editorial comment isn't it but <laughs> save that for tomorrow <laughs> we'll save that for tomorrow absolutely listen as i say there's been lots and lots of comics that have come into doctor who we can't do them all justice at all but i hope you've enjoyed that uh, and as i say we've got stuff coming up <laughs> So we are playing for laughs throughout April. And the reason for that is simply because we want to have a little bit of fun before May comes along. But more about that tomorrow. Yes, so we are going to be looking at the next, in the next couple of weeks at Peter Butterworth in The Time Meddler, Michael Robbins in The Visitation, and Doddy himself in Delta and The Bannermen. Join us throughout April as we review those episodes. So you've got time now to go and find them wherever you've got them. Go and watch them. And come back and join us over the next few weeks as we review those episodes with, of course, your favourite scores on the TARDIS doors. We'll be putting all that in as well. I'm really excited. I haven't watched Delta and the Bannerman since around about the VHS time. So I'm looking forward to going back and looking at it again, <laughs> whenever that was. I can't remember. Um, so listen, thank you, everybody, for watching and tuning in for us. I hope you've enjoyed this Easter special and this April Fool's Day special. Before we go, we've got two more jokes from Phil to have. So, Phil... Let's start with number three, Pertwee. Number three. What's the... Oh, sorry. I ruined that. Who's the scariest Time Lord? I like that one. I'm having that one. That's yeah. quite good, that. I like that one. Okay, Alex and on, go, go for your doctor, number six. What did the doctor do when he was still hungry after dinner? He went back four seconds. Oh. Did I get in it? Oh. <laughs> yeah, I quite like those two. They were the There's best out of all of them. The <laughs> if you search the dredges for it. Yeah. Uh, thank you to Have everybody. Have a been... weekend. <laughs> Lex is saying it was a fantastic show Glad you enjoyed it Lex Thank you all for watching it Garbage says two more jokes And puts the jokes in inverted commas <laughs> oh, oh, garbage. Uh, You need a fringe show Says Phil um, Kirsty he probably get cancelled yeah. <laughs> yeah. Get cancelled or charged As from today Yeah oh. Political There'll be lots comment, of blue everybody. lights behind us GT tomorrow night Yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're all living on the edge now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you, Dalek. I love you. And thank you as well to Mark as well. 
And uh, yes, we have to. Uh, a big, huge thank you, as, as Alex is saying, there to Kirsty and Garbage in the chat. Thank you for looking after everybody as so much. Doug is saying this was fun. Thank you very much. No, thank you all. Thank you all. And Garbage is saying back four seconds. That's that's good and well worth waiting for. There you go, Phil. There you go. That's not bad, is it? So listen, thank you to George, the third doctor, and to Phil, our resident joker, and also to Paul for joining me for this, our Easter special, our April Fool's Day special. Thank you so much for joining in. Thank you for subscribing to the channel. We're all thrilled this week. We've had a great week. Thank you so much for that. Um, we are trying to move up and onwards now. We want as many of you as possible for Disney Who in May. And speaking of which, yes, Headlines is back tomorrow at half past seven live where we will be looking at the alleged trailer that's just dropped. We will be discussing with you the episode titles, and I will be asking the all-important question, are you excited yet, and do you actually care? Hmm. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much, guys. I hope you've enjoyed it. We have, yes. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Apart from the Brilliant. jokes. Apart from the jokes. <laughs> <laughs> and don't forget, we are back not just with headlines, but with Who's Views Reviews in a couple of weeks' time for the Time Meddler. Make sure you're subscribed, make sure you ring the bell, and make sure you keep looking at the page for when you know when we're going to drop those. We will see you very shortly from myself and the guys here, from Kirsty and Garbage in the chat. Take care. We'll see you again soon. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Oh, and thanks to Bunny as well. Yay! Thank you, Bunny. Bye, Bunny. <laughs>